Hello, this is stream number 268, and diplomatically, I want to say hello to Nui, who diplomatically said hello. <laughs> Alright, kind of rushed today, but I want to take a slight deviation from the last two days where I was working on the NPC guide. Actually, I guess I've been working on it for five streams in a row. Yeah, um, lessons learned from... Some of this work, I think I can find it here somewhere, right? Huh. I thought it was in here somewhere. Didn't I have, like, takeaways somewhere here? Interesting. Maybe I just imagined writing this. Am I, am I just not seeing it, and I should be? I thought I had in here in the last five streams takeaways, including that it's difficult to debug stuff in Lua. But maybe I'm just imagining that I wrote that. Let me look more carefully here. There's a bug. Some suggestions there. Feedback on the chat overlay. Hey there, Void Comp Phil. How are you doing? How come I can't find this? I knew I wrote it. Maybe it was more than five days ago. Maybe it was... Let me go back further. I guess I can search for takeaways. Ah. I just didn't see it. So it was in the first day of working on this NPC guide. Takeaways from today's frustrations. Bugs in Lua are a lot tougher for me to spot. More debugging tools between Lua and the GM panel would help. Existing Lua scripts really need to be refactored. Many times I've had a long argument list that gets passed around the same set of functions consider a context object. So I've actually done this third thing in the last few streams. I did a little bit of this, but not a whole lot. But I haven't done anything here. That's what I've been thinking about this morning, addressing. Also, it would be nice to have more automated importing of scripts as I change them. So that's sort of on the side. So, uh, yeah, I was thinking that the, the goal for today would be just like I put in the stream title. Making a unit test framework for Lua. And take the template that I use and paste it here. Um, a little too wide. Zoom out a little bit. Do that. Let's shorten this, say, Lua test framework so that it, it actually fits there. Let me get a link to the page in a moment. Oh, I never got a link to yesterday's? Oh, wow. I'm, sl I'm slipping. I never made a link to that. That means I didn't update the today command yesterday either. <coughs> Dan's game. What face? All right. We can fix this. We can fix it. We can make it better, stronger, faster. Come on, on online OneNote. Go faster for me. I don't know. I get frustrated at how slow technology is sometimes. Faster. Faster. Load. Hey there, Rally Monkey. How are you doing? Look at this. I forgot to make a link to this page yesterday. Tiny Earl. Copy to clipboard. Paste. Yesterday. No. That's yes. Two, six, 267 was yesterday. All right. And then while I'm here, go to... to wait, why is the date wrong? Oh, it wasn't yesterday. It was two days ago. I've totally messed up. I keep thinking it was yesterday. It was not. I wonder if it's the same. Let me redo. Let me redo this. I don't know if that link was correct. Uh, make another one. Ah. Why does it insist on making it bold? I don't know. All right. Then 
to days. Okay, now I'm not sure if I did that right. I did do that correctly. Okay, so then this one, copy link, paste, make tiny, copy to clipboard. Back to here, paste. Okay, so one, two more places, right? Go into the game and put it there. Hopefully the game is still running. <laughs> hey there, Resubaka, how are you doing? Looking forward to tuning in again in a bit. Just thought you'd check in before running errands. Well, thanks for checking in. Hope your errands go well. Oh, she did? Nice. Right? Did she say Rimmy? Rim you? Rhyme you? <laughs> or proper pronunciation, Rimu. Let's see. Uh, the blah, 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 blah. Today. Rimu is... Attempting to set up a unit test framework for the Lua scripts that go into his game. And then that is the link update. All right, cool. And then um, do what I forgot to do the other day. <laughs> That's interesting. I just saw uh, your DM, Rally Monkey. That's funny. That's a little bit disturbing, too. <laughs> I'll have to tell you later why it was disturbing to me. Okay. Um, going to my own stream plan. Today, I would like to spend time designing and developing a unit test framework for the uh, Lua scripts that go into my... That go, not got into my game pasting the link and I just hit it so now it's there in discord all right cool let me make sure George is still around still there they're doing your duty oh yeah look he just just in the last minute he slew something probably a green slime Rhyme 8354 is that how she says it <laughs> Oh, the number is so arbitrary though it's the rhyme you that can't rhyme you that counts now I'm saying rhyme you. I'm mispronouncing my own online handle. Okay, we don't need that anymore. I probably will not need this, right? Probably not need it. So let's just turn it off. Hey there, Romania. Meta programming. You mean like programming the programming? So yeah, let me clear out the old plan. I hate it when that doesn't respect my spacing. There we go. And then no description. Nice and clean. Rename my cat Rhyme Meow. Rhyme Meow. <laughs> All right, so the plan for today is, um, uh, well, Set up a special, special test, specialized test runner uh, capable of discovering and executing unit tests for Lua scripts. So that would involve let's just call this develop. Developers, 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 develop, developers, develop. Come we don't get the little, the little dot. There we go. Set up a new, what are we going to call this? It's a, it's a command line executable program with uh, Lua embedded. And then next would be uh, write a class which discovers 
uh, Lua scripts in designated desi designated folders and discovers a uh, unit tests embedded well contained within them making this from scratch yeah that's what i do i do i do the silly things like making stuff from scratch because i bet you that there will be at least let's see it feels like there's going to be at least eight different comments from viewers today who are coming in saying did you know that there already is this it's called that and you can download it from there and then I'll have to say, yeah, I know. I didn't bother to look because I'm just making this from scratch because I want to show how it's done and how um, things work at the lowest level, and I enjoy doing it. That'll probably happen. Yeah, so that's number one, Nui. But you are, no, it doesn't count because you have to have, you actually have to know what it is. <laughs> there was a guy that made his own test for America's bachelor's degree, so you want to see how complicated it is? I don't think it's going to be that complicated. Here, I mean, I'm designing the steps right here. We're going to set up a command line executable program. So that would let me... Why? This uh, lets me... include it automatically in unit tests... in unit test runners executed as part of my existing... Uh, we call it a build system cmake based build system that's why i'm doing it you got a better mark than you so <laughs> that's okay remaining hate it's not always a competition all right we want to discover them Well, it's more than discover. So, discover Lua scripts. Discover unit tests within those scripts. Write a class. Actually, um, that's it for the class. So, so it'd be, it would be the next thing. What is the next thing? Right. Execute all, well, execute, well, determine which tests to execute. Uh, let's say by default, execute all tests. Uh, if, well, depending on command line arguments, perhaps narrow the scope of uh, what unit tests to execute. So maybe similar to gtest, perhaps similar to um, Google test. And that's going to come up again because if I want to use, if I want to leverage the existing uh, extensions that I use, one of them is catch2 and Google test explorer. And oh, that fits into the test explorer UI. I believe the way that Google Test Explorer works, or Google, you know, the way that this extension works is it expects a certain output format from the test runner. So if we mimic the output format, we can have this understand and list all our, all our Lua unit tests as well. You bought a new monitor and you love it? Hurt your wallet though? Well, it's an investment. Think of it that way, Noah. And hello, how are you doing? Nui said, did you know there's already Lunit, Lunity, Lunatest, Lua Unit, Shake, Build, Test, Deploy, Lua Spec, Pen, Light, PL, Dot, Test, Telescope, Lua, Test, Board, Busted, ah. Testy, and you test? Okay, you blow, you blown out of the water my, um, my number of estimated test frameworks, but I still will only count that as one. <laughs> Rhyme test. Yeah, that's that's the hard part. That's going to be come up with a friggin' name for it. Hardest part. Figure out what to call this thing. Actually, we'll probably want to do that first. 
let's start out with a name, right? Okay, to determine which ex determine, w determine which test to execute, and then um, execute tests and collect results. So uh, mimic. It's not going to be perhaps. In fact, I think it has to be mimic Google tests command line argument requirements design interface interface yet another unit test framework for Lua yacht flibber <laughs> test driven test framework yeah is this Omni Rainier or something else it's supporting Omni Rainier. so let me let me connect the dots so I'm working on this game so this is how we'll start. Oh, and you can't see the result of that command because I need to actually go into my game, which is Twitch integrated, and turn on the chatbot. So let me do that. So this is the game I'm working on. It's called Omni Arania, and it is a collection of different components. So I run in my web browser the front end, which is all in JavaScript. It talks through a web socket to the cloud-based server cluster that I run, which is mostly C++ in its framework, mostly custom made. And it is using Lua scripts for the NPC AI and other things, what I call the game systems. So they uh, hook in through here, for example, the NPC AI scripts. So here's, for example, the script that's run when an NPC uh, uh, is attacked by another NPC, right? If we hit we launch a particle, play a sound, we take off hit points, they drop loot if they die, otherwise we're just updating the character's health, etc., etc. Thank you for that follow. So I've been developing this AI script over the last five streams for my game, and it's actually been edited in the production environment, and it's mostly centered around this guy named George, his job is to be here at the beginning of the game, so to speak. Players pop into this sewer system. This um, fabulous artwork that you see here is a sewer. And his job is to, sort of like a tutorial thing, he kind of introduced some of the core mechanics of the game. He'll say, hello, I am an NPC. You can talk to me. Uh, you can interact with me. Here are the things you can do. But, not, but, but in character, right? And one of the things you can ask him to do is to help guide you out of this nasty sewer system. And he will walk this path all the way to these stairs here and tell you, well, here's the way out. And then he, go, and then he returns back. And the returning back is important because it's a multiplayer game. And other players could log in at any moment and they'll be like, what the heck is this? And when, as soon as George gets back, he'll say, oh, hi, there's more of you. And, you know, repeat the process. So there's a lot of Lewis script now in there to control what state he's in. He's right now in the patrol state where he just kind of wanders around. If one of these slimes gets too close, he will pursue and slay it like that. And then go back to patrol mode. And when he's leading someone out of the dungeon, he'll go into path mode where he goes, or guide mode where he paths to the exit. Then he goes into return mode where he paths back to the starting point and then goes back to patrol mode. So that's all in Lua and there's, a pathfinding algorithm in C++ that is wrapped into the Lua. And in the last five days, I've been working on that. And one of the takeaways from that work was that it was very painful. Uh, where did I write this down? Oh, I wrote it the first day, right? Yeah, takeaways, there were frustrations off of the bat because Lua bugs for me were tougher to spot for these main three reasons. And I've addressed reason three as part of reason two. The reason one is a big one. I feel like I need more tools to help debugging and more integration between the scripting and my game master panel. So today I thought I, 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 could do, I could do some stuff towards the debugging just by having a test framework so that instead of live debugging it in the real production server, I just run it on the command line to just to test that the scripts are doing what they should do. And it shouldn't be too hard because all we really need to do, like I'm outlining here, is set up a new command line executable, that's easy, and then write a class that just f discovers Lua scripts and their tests and then runs them. And as long as we mimic Google tests input and output, we can hook it right in just like Google tests works. So that's that's my optimistic goal. Hey there, Slickver. How are you doing? 
Slick for one of the founders of the stream. <laughs> and uh, Kappa Mangos, how are you today? Why do you have so much view distance? You mean in the Game Master mode? Because... That could be, there could be asking two different things, so I'm not sure. So the view distance as in how far you can see in the game from the the camera point, it just is set up this way because uh, it seemed right. Um, but also we can see through walls and all the way to the edge because this is the game master view. When uh, a normal player logs in, I'll show you what you should see. It shouldn't be black. If it is black, it could be a browser issue. There are some browsers that aren't quite compatible. This is what a normal player sees. It's, and you'll see further if there are torches on the wall. But if you go through to an area of the map... Oh, there's combat. I won. If you go to an area of the map where there's no light, uh, you can't really see very many squares around you because it's dark, right? Oh, these, these are deadly enemies now. There's a bug in their script right now where they can attack twice per second. And there makes them very difficult. So if everything is black and you can't see even two squares near you, it's probably a, a bug. Uh, might be a browser incompatibility. If it's more like this, then that's intentional. That it's supposed to imply that the area is dark. You can't see very far unless there is a light near you. And as I around this corner, I can see that there is a lit area because there's a torch on the wall there. From the game master's point of view, I want to be able to see everything now. So there's nothing hidden. Uh, we talked about in the past, if I wanted to preview what players would see, rather than having to have this other window and actually be logged in twice, I could have the Game Master open a camera from a player's point of view and even maybe even control a player to, um, to test things out, but I haven't done that yet. You're in the garden. How do you get to the weapons? Let's see. Where are you? You are there. Okay, so this NPC right... Uh, one square up from you will hand you swords. If you talk, if you do T and then up arrow and you're talking to him and you say, you type the word sword, he will give you a sword. And then to get down to the sewers, it's just over here. There's a, through this open gate, there's a stairs down that leads you there. And then from there you can fight these slimes, make your way to George and you can even talk to him and test out his um, guidance script if you want. I'm seeing some lag, but I'm wondering if that's the front end or the front end or the back end. Not lagging now. Shouldn't there be uh, alternative answers to the NPCs? Yeah, there's not much yet because I'm focusing mostly on the engine, but I can show you what they can say right now. So Bob is the guard that. So he here are the things you can ask him. In general, you'll always be able to ask him name and job. That's modeled after the old Ultima games, where that's how you sort of break the ice with any NPC you don't know. You ask them their name, you ask them their job, and then based on what they say, so like in this case, you ask job, and he says, I guard this place from troublemakers. It, you're supposed to get a hint that some of these words you could ask and, and lead down other conversation paths. So guard, for example, if you say guard, he'll say, occasionally the denizens of the sewers get restless. So if you say sewers, he'll say, be careful down there. If you go down there, make sure you to bring a sword or something. So then you say sword says, I have many swords in my arsenal. Do you need a sword? And if you, it'll, go, it'll actually go to a sword state where he'll, he's asking you yes, no. If you have room, he'll say, take this spare one I happen to have here, and, and it'll run the give sword script, which is in Lua again. And that's pretty much it for this conversation because it's really just bare mechanics. There's a hidden one here called Cthulhu. Cthulhu, that name sounds familiar. But that's completely hidden. You didn't see that. You can't prove that it's there. <laughs> So as I add more game content, of course, there'll be a lot more states that a conversation can be in, and there'll be plenty more conversation choices. But right now, it's pretty bare bones. I don't play EverQuest, but I do play World of Warcraft, and in the past, I've played all of the Ultima games, which my game is inspired by. And so I know certain elements are similar between EverQuest and World of Warcraft, which I play, so... If you um, were to refer to a common mechanic like kiting or ag aggro and threat, I, I know that stuff and I'm trying to incorporate it, that into the game. For example, there's a bug right now where if I put this enemy here, 
George will have pulled aggro on this, or well, it's the opposite way. The slime has pulled George's aggro. The slime is now in George's aggro list. George is trying to pursue that slime. Uh, I haven't yet enhanced his AI script to know that he can go find that slime if he goes around the corner. So right now he's just in vain trying to cross the water, which is not, which is not um, passable. Uh, you don't need to equip items right now. As long as it's in your inventory, then it, it's used as a weapon when you attack. If you don't have a sword, you can still attack and just do less damage. No, it just needs to be in your inventory. And you can have multiple swords, it doesn't matter. The script that determines how much damage you do, it, I'll show it to you. That's in this attack script. So, actually it's before the attack script. I guess it would be in the combat system. There should be something in here that looks... Oh yeah, here we go. Items are player's items. Look at all items. And if it hasn't... What is this doing? If it's not nil, so if, it's, if, it, if there's something in that slot, check if the item is a sword, then that's the weapon we're going to pick. And as soon as we have a weapon, we break out of that. And um, that weapon is then passed on to the attack script when you attack. And we use the weapon to get the damage bonus, damage number of rolls, and damage die to throw. So it's like Dungeons and Dragons. So it's 1d8 plus 1. And the roll to hit takes into account the enemy's dexterity. If you hit, then there's a roll for damage, which uses, you know, 1d8 plus 1. And it does the visual particle effect and the, the audio particle effect, the sound. And then does the damage accounting. You either kill the monster and they drop the loot. Or you just update their health. And if you miss, it just says you swing and you miss. That's literally what it is. The whether, what, what, what weapon you're using, it's all pretty simple. Just looping through your inventory until it finds a sword. <laughs> so, obviously this is primitive and I'll be changing this later. Probably we'll have dedicated equipment slots. So you'll have to drag your sword or your mace or your dagger or whatever to a special inventory slot that's your designated weapon and then so instead of looping through all of our inventory it'll look at specific designated inventory slots to tell um, what you're using it, we could also set it up so that instead of a generic attack button or attack key there's actually a list of your abilities like they have in world of warcraft and so you like like when you hit one you're using your sword two you're using a spell something like that we haven't gotten that far yet uh, we're still pretty early on in this. Expect more changes and more and more engine development first, and then some content will follow that. So yeah. So today, um, so that's the background for what I'm doing today. I am getting more into writing the game scripts for things like NPC um, artificial intelligence, and this is difficult to debug because Lua is a very loose typed language. I don't know if I have a typo or if there is uh, the wrong type, like a string used instead of, of, of a number, until it actually runs, and then it's not always obvious to me you know, where that is. So my thought was to improve the tooling a bit, the automation a bit, so that instead of just writing the script and plopping it in here and hoping it works, I will um, break the script up into smaller pieces. So like, for example... The heal script is pretty small, right? So there might be a test companion function called test heal, and all its purpose will be will be to make sure that the heal function works properly. And we call that a unit test. And then I can have that always run every time I change the script, and then if I make a mistake or something breaks, the unit test will start failing and then we'll know. How do you write to Cthulhu? It does not work. Um, you have to be talking to, not George, but the other guy in town. This guy. And you have to say, when you're talking to him, you have to say K-T-U-L-U. -U. So you might have misspelled it. <laughs> and, I mean, I'll show you what he says. He just says Cthulhu. That name sounds familiar. That's what he should say. And that's just sort of an inside joke because there is a one of my moderators is named Cthulhu, and um, we have an inside joke that um, there'll be NPCs in the game that kind of 
for some reason, Cthulhu will have a reputation with them, and he might even be pursued by one of the NPCs in the game. So that when he plays the game, he's got sort of a specialized experience as kind of both an inside joke in the stream and also to kind of reward him for being a moderator and helping out the channel and all that. And I hope to do more of that as I uh, get people helping and participating in the stream more. I'd like to put more dedicated content for like honoring those viewers. Either that or empower them to do more things in the game than most users can. Don't tell everyone that, they'll find that themselves. Well, on, only a few people are hearing it now. Most people, I count on the fact that most most viewers aren't here right now. <laughs> yeah, I won't I won't post that in the Discord or anything or tweet that because then yeah, then everyone would know, right? So it's a reward for being here and watching that you get inside scoop. <laughs> hey there, Mister Love Pickle, you're here. Nice. Of course, we're gonna have to have to have some kind of in game presence that honors people like Mr. Love Pickle in some way. And everyone else playing it will be like, what the heck is this? And only Mr. Love Pickle will get the reference. <laughs> well, I guess you could clip it, but you don't want to ruin everyone's fun. <laughs> All right. So yeah, to if, if you're hoping to see more of the graphics stuff, it might be a disappointing day. Just to give you a fair warning, I'm going to... Um, really tried to work on behind the scenes stuff to support developing these scripts for the game in a way that I don't get so frustrated and and it goes more quickly and more efficiently so uh, we're talking about setting up a test runner that will uh, discover Lua tests and run them and kind of mimic Google tests input and output so mimic Google tests standard way of uh, reporting test results success errors etc and then you know uh, uh, get well integrate a test runner uh, with uh, with C CMake or C test or actually it's more that it's yeah, more it's that it's integrated with CMake and this is really fighting me on that extra M, isn't it? Integrate test runner with CMake and VS Code extensions. Test Explorer, Exploder, Explorer UI, and um, what's it called again? It's like Catch Two, Catch Two, and Google Test Explorer. being very explicit in my notes today. So my opinion of C++ dying, and is it worth learning C++ in 2019? I don't think that it's dying. It's mostly that I'm myself branching out and finding other languages as being superior for various specific contexts. Like, for example, these AI scripts. If I want to experiment and change them live in the game, it's much easier to do that when it's Lua than C++ because Lua can be reinterpreted on the fly, whereas C++, would I would need a compiler to recompile the code. Then I had to have uh, more work involved in dynamically replacing the compiled code in the game. Or I could just give up and say, every time I want to change something, I got to stop the whole game and then update the code and then restart it. So it's a lot of its convenience and also just certain aspects of it make it more, uh, um, I guess it does come, it ultimately comes down to convenience. You found a bug? There are uh, about 200 bugs. So it's very likely you might have already found, you might have found one already found, but if in the case that you'd found one that no one else has found, that would be cool. So what did you find? You're down here. It's possible you're seeing a display bug, or what looks like it. There's some of the way that the rendering system hides things that are outside your line of sight are kind of weird right now. So is it a rendering system bug, or is it, um, is it something else? And hey there, Toulouse and Alpha Most, or Alpha Mostafa. Let me, let, me, uh, let me say hello to you. And Shake Soda, how are you doing? 
was busted unsuitable. Uh, so that will be number two. <laughs> I was saying at the very beginning of the stream uh, that doing this, I like to do stuff from scratch, even if it's already implemented elsewhere. Undoubtedly, a lot of people will come into the stream and ask, like, why are you not using something that already does this for Lua? And Nui had, like, a whole list of things that already do this. Um, the reasons are, like, a lot of the work that I do on this stream, I like to do stuff from scratch because I enjoy it. And also, I think it's cool to show other people how things work and how you could, how you would make your, how would you make such a thing? From um, if you started with nothing, like let's say um, "busted" is the name of a nice Lua test framework. Well, someone had to write "busted," so how do they do it, right? When you respawn at a save point, you hit S while loading, and then you hit continue traveling down. Oh yeah, that's a known bug. You're talking about when you are um, holding down a key and you're moving, and then you then you either um, release the key and press something else quickly, or you release the key at just the right time. It doesn't detect that you stopped moving and it just continues going. That is a bug, yeah. So we already know about that. But I will give you a point in my channel anyway for reporting it because I, I like to award that. I don't know if it's a browser thing or it's a backend thing. So that's one of those bugs that I don't know the root cause yet. So um, I I have to balance a lot of different work here. So. There's obviously interaction with you guys as viewers of the channel, being entertaining and all that. Uh, there is adding game content, and then there is working on the game engine to support more content, and then there's fixing the bugs of various levels. So if I were to stop and just do bug fixing, the game dev would stop for like a month. So I'm trying to keep a balance. Uh, what do points do? The points will eventually be used in game to redeem things like special items, access to special areas, that kind of thing, as a reward to my viewers for um, engaging in chat and helping out and sort of get people hyped up about the interaction. Right now, you can't really use them other than to brag about how many points you have. So <laughs> they don't really have value right now other than, than that. What programming language is the game engine made with? It's C++ with Lua scripting. So the Lua scripting is what I'm focusing on today in, it looks like this. So this is what's run when you choose to attack an enemy. It does, this is how it calculates a random number to see if you hit or not. And then it calls another function to do the similar thing for damage. And the way it integrates back into the C++ is there's a, a user data Lua variable called game. And when you invoke methods like chat on it, it's actually crossing a boundary from Lua back into the C++ to interact with the C++ framework uh, to do things like sending a chat message, right? So it's not built into Lua. It's something we had to integrate, you know, to, to add to Lua. And then we get back to Lua and um, there's more stuff like making sound effects, making up visual effects, which ultimately lead back into game also, but they're subroutines. You can't see they're, what they're in. Why don't I use Lua uh, Unity 3D? The, it's not that the um, engine like Unity or Unreal is bad or anything. It's just I like to make my own stuff. So it's out of it's out of choice that I am doing this from scratch. Can a game engine be written in C++ but only without scripting? Yes. So I mentioned it a little bit b uh, before. You can get the equivalent of these pluggable scripts that right now I have in Lua. Uh, for example, the attack script, you could do this in C++. It's just you would need a loading system. Or you could choose that you can't change it unless you stop the game, change it, and then start. Because C++ needs to be compiled. And there's nothing intrinsic to the language or the standard library that allows you to change a, a, something while it's running. So I would have to do stuff like make this function a loadable module, and then have something in the game where I can unload the attack module and then load a new version of it. So it could be done. It's just, it would be a lot more work for me. And there's just, I, I it's it, a lot of it comes down to personal preference. I prefer the feel of doing this part of the game in Lua because it's, um, I, I'm more efficient at it. 
The downside is like today, I'm spending time making a unit test framework for this because since it's in Lua, I can't leverage the existing stuff out there for a Google Test Explorer is for Google Test is for C++, so I can't use it. I have to either find something else or make something. And I like making stuff, so that's what I'm doing. It looks like a massive project for one man to do. Yeah, it's massive. So I've been working on this a year, and I ex fully expect to work be working on this at least six more months before I actually do game dev on it. And you just have to factor, factor that in. It's going to be a massive project, so I expect it to take years. But it's uh, one of my life goals. It's on my bucket list, and so I'm going. I'm pursuing that. I think once you decide that something is on your bu so-called bucket list, like that you you want to do it before you kick the bucket, or if it's a life goal of yours, you shouldn't let its scale daunt you, even if it's massive. Perhaps if it's more than you think you can do on your own, you would go hire a team to do it. You don't have money to hire a team, you would go work on a job and build up that savings. But you always want to have the end goal in mind and um, not let its scale, its massiveness daunt you if you really want to do it. Yeah, boost.dll sounds similar to what I was just talking about, right? Uh, to be done. It's, uh, it'd be a way to, to do the loadable stuff in C++. All right. Uh, I'm still doing my plan here. We have, we have a lot of new faces today. I hope you guys are all doing well. And I don't mind chatting and answering questions, but I will have to kind of shift the balance at some point back to my work. And perhaps other people in chat who have been here a while can, can um, invoke some of the commands I have or maybe start answering some of the questions. Why am I using VS Code instead of VS 90? I have a command for that. Uh, I haven't yet gone to 2019 mostly because... When I started working on this, 2019 wasn't there. So, um, in 2017 works for me just fine for what I need. So I haven't. It hasn't been enough motivation on uh, for me to, to to jump to something new. You require ice cream as payment. If I ever meet you in real life in Perry, I guarantee I will buy you your favorite ice cream if I can. <laughs> Still rocking 2013. That's perfectly fine. I the way I see it is if you're not missing something and you're not needing something. You're fine. You might be missing something you don't know you're missing. And so it's healthy for people to ask, why aren't you using VS 2019? Especially if they say, hey, you should try out VS 2019 because there's such and such a feature that it looks like it might be good for you. And then that's a healthy thing. So if there's something in 2019 that you think that would be helping me, I'd love to hear it. Um, but right now, but, uh, I use VS Code so I can switch to Linux and Mac and have the same user experience. But under the hood, I'm still using Visual Studio. I'm just using it for the compiler, the linker, or the IntelliSense, and all of that. They have some neat performance and security fixes. So that's something to consider, right? So that's something I would put in my notes here. As if I run into a performance issue, or if I become aware of a security problem, I would definitely consider 2019. I would ask the question, does 2019 solve the security or performance issue I'm facing? Security is kind of tricky, though. You kind of have to be more proactive. So I need to improve on that a little bit more. I need to be looking for, are there any security, fish, uh, security issues in 2017 that should compel me to move to 2019? I would imagine that Microsoft would have said, would have urged people to move to 2019 if there was something really bad about it, uh, 2017. Anyway, uh, yeah, so I'm using VS Code mostly as my editor, but the compiler and linker are all in um, Visual Studio. Okay, this is pretty much done, right? So now we're going to do it. So the hardest part first, what are we going to call this thing? Something that incorporates the two main aspects of what we're doing, that it's unit testing and Lua. Them bots, in, them boys in the cave insta kill. Uh, yeah, the the um, George um, is very adept at slaughtering those slimes. And now, if you're talking about they insta kill you, yeah, they they have a bug there right now. They're attacking too fast. George is in in, in un, un um in invulnerable. The slimes don't even think that they should attack George, so um he is way over over overpowered right now. 
Is there a technique to attacking? I would just spam the Q and then the arrow key. Q, Q left, Q left, Q left. You can attack at most twice per second, so if you get the timing right, you should be able to win against the slimes. I could, I should probably fix that bug about their attack frequency. They're supposed to only attack once every second or every two seconds. Because these slimes are meant to be like easy pushovers for new players, and it shouldn't get challenging until you get back to this area here and fight these guys, like where, where you are, Noah. These guys should be a challenge. These ones here are meant to be impossible. Um, unless you are in a large group of like four or five players. And these guys will pull from a long distance. This guy would have slaughtered you if I didn't put a limit to how far he can travel. Yeah, see, you beat him. Good job. Now pick up the loot that you earned. <laughs> All right. Yeah, see, but he defeated you. Hold on. I can fix this. Lua, heal, Noah. Now you just hit escape. I might have to heal you again. He's about to kill you again. Heal, Noah. You should be able to hit escape and then move again. Up, oh, and you respond. Yeah, see, they're tough. I can help you out here. Yeah, they're pretty tough. Yeah, you're you're getting killed a lot. The good thing is you don't uh, lose a whole lot right now. <laughs> Yep, you beat him. You got him. See, it just took a while. It's just persistence. Yeah, they're a little, little over-tuned because at the time I was making them, we had two or three players here. And they're so these are more tuned. Like the equivalent would be the enemies in a World of Warcraft dungeon where you're meant to be in a party of five. So if you go in there solo, theoretically you could do it, but it's going to be super challenging. And these guys back here are sort of the equivalent of raid bosses. <laughs> so... You'd only be able to defeat these if you um, ha if you if you were very very lucky. Anyway, back I can't I think we can close. No, we'll just go back to Tartar Starter Town for now, so it's not so um the sound doesn't distract me. Let me um establish a new project now. I can go uh, to any file at the top level. I'm gonna choose the make file, and I'm gonna click a button here to make a new folder. Now the moment of truth. What do we call this thing? Is there a form of healing? Yes. If you talk to this guy and say the word heal, he does exactly what I just ran manually as the GM. It just puts your health back up to 100%. That's the healing. The other, I guess the other form of healing is whenever you die, you can choose to respawn. So it's really primitive. It's just, just bare bones to test those core mechanics, but not... I mean, the mechanics themselves aren't even really done yet. Okay, I waited too long, and now it went away. I have to click it again. What to name this thing? I know what I'll call it. I'm going to call it Moon Unit, because Lua is moon in Portuguese, and this is a unit test framework. And Moon Unit is also a fun name. We're going to call it Moon Unit. Who, who wants to bet that um, there already is something called Moon Unit for a test framework? If not, then maybe I'll trademark it right now. See, someone's already made something called Moon Unit. This is my lot in life, is I can never come up with a unique name. <laughs> um, but eh, it, always, it always a little discourages me a little bit that I can't come up with a unique name, but hey, I was on the spot. What, what can you say? We're going to call it Moon Unit anyway for now. Um, I'm going to start off this project like any other that has a similar execution style. So it's a command line program, right? So like AWS Play is like this. So let me look at its make file and just copy it. But I'm going to take the entire project's files and copy them all. Can I do it with this copy? Paste? Yeah. And we'll say this is the make file for moon unit. And the sources, let's just say we have a main. I don't think we need a timekeeper for a unit test framework, so we're going to toss those. And we just have a main.cpp. It's an executable. It's going to be go into the applications folder, and probably I want to link with Lua library. System abstractions is probably it for now, right? 
I like Moon Unit better, Nui. Sorry. If you want, if you really, really feel strongly, I'll call it Moon Unit, A.K.A. Yacht Flipper. <laughs> I'm going to be making a test runner for Lua, Romania. So it's just going to find and execute Lua scripts, but it's not going to be written in. It's going to be written in C++, but it it's providing Lua facilities. If that makes sense. And I don't I'm not gonna do TLS, so I don't need that little blurb. Um this is to make sure it's statically linking with the standard runtime library, so I like to keep that. I think that's all we need for bare bones, right? And I can like get rid of all this junk. I'll probably want standard lib and standard IO. And that's probably it for now. And then I can just eliminate everything that I all this stuff I probably don't... Oh, wait, but there's environment. I like to keep some of the stuff, so... This is an important one, which I'll want to use. Uh, a utility that will read a file in, in as a string. That's in this library of mine, file. And we're also using string. So let's include string. What else am I using here? usage information. Here we go. Moon unit. Right now it'll be do stuff with Lua and unit test and unit testing. Maybe. <laughs> Why not have fun while I'm writing this? Lunar unit. Lunit. Hmm. But Moon Unit is a cool name because it it actual there are there's an actual person named Moon Unit. Right? Moon Unit Zappa. So, there we go. <laughs> Potential confusion with Moonscript. It'll never be as big as Moonscript, so I'm not worried about the confusion. I just needed a name for my own stuff. Um, I do want to capitalize it, though, so let me... I have to put an X at the end, because Windows will not let me change the capitalization without changing something else. I've run into that problem before, so I always add an X on the end. Then change this capitalization and remove the X. Environment. Okay, I don't need operation. Command line arguments, maybe? We don't need that. Actually, I don't know what will happen in environment. Process command line arguments. Yeah, so what um, command line arguments will we have? Um, just an initial state right now. And we'll just say everything is extra. Well, okay, let's have an extra state then. Um, actually, then I don't need an extra. What am I doing? Yeah, we don't need to pull anything out, so I don't need any of this junk. And yeah, there's no expected stuff. This is just a... Uh, skeleton for what I'll put in there later. We don't need certificate authorities uh, certificates, so we don't need that. We're not doing web stuff. We're not listing buckets in S3. None of that. We just have the main function. I like this boilerplate because it detects memory leaks if I run it on Windows in the debug build. Don't buffer standard output. I hate it when I accidentally leave it buffered. We're going to run this standard kind of boilerplate. And we don't need to do this. We're going to do our thing and then say we're done. And maybe do something. Observable. <laughs> LOL. LUL. So that will be printf hello world. Just to make sure that this works, right? So, in order for it to be pulled into my overall build, I gotta go to my top level CMake list and do an add subdirectory for things directly in this repository. Uh, I'm not gonna put it directly in this repository. I'm gonna make this a sub repository, so we will um, pull it in here. JL. So, no, that's moon unit. And then rebuild. 
Lowell. Oh, a nice one. Lowell. <laughs> Clever. I'll give you a point for that. What languages am I fluent in? Programming languages? A bunch. Like C++. Let's see if I can list them all. C, C++. I used to do this a lot, but then a viewer pointed out to me how silly that is. Because they really are separate languages. Moon Union alphabetically comes after it, probably. To, to lose, you always, met, you always catch these things for me. I'll quickly move that while we're listing languages. I know C Sharp, I know Java, I know Lua, of course, I know Python. Oh, who am I being raided by? CM Griffin? Mr. Sir, how are you today? It's nice to be raided by you. Thank you very much. This uh, nifty chat overlay was made by CM Griffin. So if you haven't checked out his stream, you should. He's an awesome web dev, makes overlays for Twitch as well. So he'll either be working on that overlay or he'll be doing the marketing site for it. I'm doing awesome. There are a lot of new viewers today and I've been doing a lot more chatting than working. But um, today I am trying to recover a bit from some frustrations from a week ago because I'm starting to develop more of my games built in, um, or not built in, but my games um, l script logic. And since I've decided to do it in Lua, I've run into issues because I'm not as adept at Lua. Some of the bugs have been really hard to find for these different reasons, and one of them is I, I need more debugging tools. So one step towards that that I'm taking today is um, I decided, rather than use an already existing one, because my stream is all about doing stuff from scratch, I was going to make a, a unit test framework for Lua scripts from scratch. And we already did the hardest part. It's very controversial, but I'm going with the name Moon Unit because it's Moon is Lua. Lua is Moon in Portuguese, and it's unit testing. Uh, it's controversial because um, I'm going against what my viewers have suggested in their names. Not saying that their names are bad, but I really, when, I, when that Moon Unit name caught in my head, I'm like, oh, I'm going to go with that. <laughs> Figuring out email issues. That means beta signups are very soon. Nice. Yeah, so this overlay is in alpha right now. And in beta, I suppose that means more people will be able to check it out. There's a problem where it suggests it's for Moon script. Which thing? Because of the name Moon, it's suggesting Moon script? Yeah, but Moon script is also related to Lua, right? It's named after Lua because it's transpiling its own language into Lua. What is this? Hold on now, I think about it. Didn't you read Raimu yesterday? Oh, Raid. I think, he, yeah, I think he did. He had a headache yesterday. So did I. What's up with that, CM Griffin? I had a, I thought I had a migraine yesterday and I had like a mild headache all day. Yeah, was yesterday just national or worldwide headache day? I don't know. Anyway, um, that's what I'm doing today. So we did the hardest part so far, making a name for the thing. And, oh, there's a problem in line 10. In, in, including Timekeeper doesn't exist. Okay. Must have been, yeah. You didn't? Well, count yourself lucky, because it sucks to have a headache. I do not even have a shell open today. That's how incompetent I am. Let's run a shell. Let's unlock the git and then um let's set up let's set up in the build directory just so we can play around with it. So this is moon unit debug. It's just moon unit. Right. Hello world. Yay, we did a thing. <laughs> So I want to make this set up as another repository. So a couple of the things I want to do. I want to go to that directory and do git init. And then I want to do a um, add dot git commit m initial revision. Because I figure it's something that builds and does something, so it counts. And then uh, remote add origin 
And it's going to be git at github.com, rainbow8354, moonunit.git, right? So I can't actually push that because that doesn't exist yet on GitHub. Let me make it exist. I'm the creator. We're going to create something. It's going to be called moon unit. And it's there. So then I can push it. Git push origin master. The U sets the upstream for us so that if I uh, push again or pull, it I don't have to say origin anymore. It's um like this says, branch master has been set up to track remote branch master from origin. That's what the U does. All right. So I'm teaching you guys Git at the same time. That's how you set up a new project integrated with CMake. And the minimum requirements are that at the top level, if your program is not at the top level, you'll want to add subdirectory. Or if it's at the top level, you can skip that. The thing itself will have to have an add executable, which lists your source files. And then these are sort of just decorations that I want to put it in an applications folder if it shows up in Visual Studio. Or I want to pick static link library explicitly on Unix, that kind of thing. Uh, the only other thing that's really required is if you have dependencies, this is my suggested way you do it. You use the target link libraries. I use these this variable, so if I change the name of the project, I only need to change it in one place. That's optional, but you you want to list your executable and then public if it is um, required at the API level, so to speak. Usually you'll do public, and you just list the other libraries you depend on, either other projects or libraries built into the OS. You don't have to list the standard C and C++ libraries explicitly in target link libraries because I believe that's just always built in and assumed by CMake. All right. A bunch of people came in and I haven't waved to them. Hey, they're stacking. And Crumpet, I didn't see you chatting. Oh, you waved like right, well, 13 minutes ago. I didn't see that. I'm sorry. And of course, Mr. Sir. Did not wave to you. And Helmer32. Hi. Kind of lurking today. That's fine. I have this, um, I call it my stream helper. It's also called the bouncer. And it's got a little column here with a little wave. So that if you chat in my channel, you kind of show up for me and then I wave back to you. If you choose to lurk, that's fine. Um, it's sorted by last message, so I probably won't see you. If you want to lurk and be um, not, not have me see you, then... Just don't chat. That's the rules of lurkerhood. If you chat, you're no longer a lurker unless you do the lurk command. All right. So yeah, this, and then just having a main function that does something is the minimum, right? I like to set up some of these other standard things because I've done this so many times. Like, this is just a one-liner with conditional compilation for Windows that's just so useful for what it costs, which is very little. Turns on memory leak checking. So if I ran this in the debugger, it would tell me if I had a memory leak. Let allow me to demonstrate. I will do a memory leak. I will say int dummy is new int. Right? And we'll build this. And then I will debug this. So this is let's make a I'll show you how to debug stuff. So we'll make a um new configuration. It's a launch. And the launch will be, I wonder why I didn't indent that. That's silly. The launch will be moon unit. And then the program will leverage the workspace folder. And we got to do this thingy because that's where we built everything. Moon unit, moon unit exe. And then now we can run that. And I can just say go. Look at that. Detected memory leaks. And it tells you it is allocation number 150, which is actually kind of impressive because that's the only one I did. It turns out that there are 149 other memory allocations involved in everything leading up to that. So if you actually wanted to see where 150 is, here's the trick. You set that to 150 and uncomment it, and then you run it in the debugger. And this is a really cool part, I think. It will actually automatically break. Oh, it can't open it. Why not? Anyway, it's, it should automatically break at that execute at that allocation number, so you can see where the leak was. Isn't that cool? I think it's cool. 
So if you don't have any memory leaks, you, when you run it in the debugger to completion, you, um, that's interesting. It's not opening the window. Yeah, there is the window. It will um, just say it executed with code zero and it won't tell you that there were any memory leaks detected. No memory leaks is a good thing. <laughs> Could also use a memory sanitizer. Yeah, I know, Nui. You have um, given me a lot of good suggestions on using that in the past. So it's on my list of things to go to if stuff like the built-in memory leak checker is not good enough for me. So, um, yeah. I recommend at least this because it costs so, so little. If you're on Microsoft's platform, you just need one line. And there it is. Uh, I'm not... See, I could make stuff from scratch like that, but... If I'm not interested in it, then I'm not going <laughs> to... Not too interested in memory sanitization right now. Okay, anyway, uh, we want to actually do something other than this. I think the next step would be to use a library I already wrote, which can scan for files. I already wrote this, so it's just a matter of using it. I believe I put it in system abstractions file. No. Directory... Well, directory monitor is if I want to see if something changed. I'll probably get to that later for, like, auto-deployment. But for now, I just need file, I think. Maybe I put it here. I think it was list directory. Yeah, list directory. That's exactly what I want. So I'm going to call list directory. So we're not doing that anymore. Let's just, let's just change this. We'll up our requirements to be list all nearby Lua scripts. So we're going to call that system abstractions. It's going to return, no, it's not returning anything. So it needs a vector of strings. So this will be Lua script paths goes there. And then the directory, Rather than hard coding a directory, let's have it use the directory in which the program is actually located. I could use the working directory too. Which one would I rather do? Do I actually have a working current directory? No. I have this under system abstractions because the way you find the parent directory of your executable varies according to operating system. And I decided to implement this in one place and um, sort of leave it inside there and not have to worry about it. So if I want to show you how it's actually implemented, let's do that. Where is... It's not sorted very well. It's in... Here it is. So in Windows, it would be calling get module file name and then path remove file spec to remove the directory part and then... Or is it to add the directory part? I forget. I forget what that does exactly. So that's the thing. I coded it, and then it's like code and forget. Fix path delimiters. I forget why. Oh, that's to make it forward forward slash instead of back slash for consistency. I, I'm a stickler for consistency. So that's what it looks like on Windows. Now on, on Mac, it looks like this. You call ns get executable path, and you call real path to reduce symbolic links. And then uh, I think I just manually put in the slashes or something. And then in Linux, it is a real path with proc self exe. So because it's slightly different on each OS, I button this up into system abstractions. And then from my main, I can just call um, system abstractions get or file get exe parent directory. And I don't have to worry about what operating system this runs on. When I get it to run on Windows and it works, I'm pretty confident that I can run it on both Mac and Linux and it'll still work there. It'll just be some things will be slightly different. Hey there, Manez. There's all, Nui said there's also Dr. Memory alloc application, which is like Valgrind, but supports Windows. You never tried it. I don't remember you mentioning that before, so let me put that in my notes. I do have some, um, quite a few notes from Nui about things to try if I ever need more than just the casual memory leak detection. Yeah, believe that the way, like Shake Soda, like, but believe you're right. The way this works is the memory allocation standard functions in C are wrapped by the C runtime library. And if you enable it by setting these flags, it enables some extra conditional logic to attach 
uh, little breadcrumbs on every allocation. And also it keeps extra tracking lists so that when you get to the end, especially if you have, I think it's that one. You like, it's automatically done as, as during the um, epilogue of the program. So the extra code that the compiler adds at the after main returns. And it just basically looks through the list and sees what's still there because by the turn by the time you return from main, you should have, you know, deallocated everything you allocated, and it just lists them all. In the middle of a move right now, so you haven't set up your PC yet, so you're on your phone. Ah, I see. Well, thank you for stopping by anyway. I understand it might be harder to read the code, but that's okay. Okay, what do we want to do with this list? I think right now we're just gonna want to print it. So we'll have a const auto Lua script path in Lua script paths, and we'll do a printf. Uh, print, and we'll just print the raw name, and then um, Lua script path convert it from a C++ string to a C string. Let's try that. It's not a member of system abstraction. Oh, because it's file, colon, colon, yeah. Okay, so now when I run it, oh, I'm in the wrong directory. It listed everything, so that's right. It's listing, there's no filter on it. We wanted to apply a filter, right? Yeah, so let's apply a filter. So this isn't script paths, it's just file paths. So let's do a filter, which would be just, I think we just need to look at the last four characters. So we need to make sure that the file path is at least four characters long. If it's greater than or, greater than or equal to four, actually even cleaner would be to do this, to do it this way. Uh, static const Lua file extension equals dot Lua, right? And then say, as long as it's greater than or equal to that one's length, and file path dot substring file path length minus that. Let's, we can actually pre-compute that as well, right? Static cons, ooh. Size, actually, let's just call it auto. This should, I forgot to put the type here. Auto Lua file extension length is that right? And then that goes here and here. So if that substring equals the file extension, then we'll print it. Let's try that. Just saw your self tagged had headphones off while you were in the daily stand up. Uh, I think all I did was wave at you, Chris. I don't think anyone was tagging you other than to say hi. So, hi. I hope your stand-up went well. Oh, someone was asking what Bouncer does? Yeah, just right now, it mostly just reminds me to say hi to people. Mellow. That's always the best kind of stand-up meeting, right? Is the mellow kind, like no, nothing urgent or catastrophic is going on. So, okay, so Moon Unit doesn't find anything until I, let's let's put something here, so where would I find something? On, oh, thank you for that follow. If I go to Realm Server uh, Source ECS Scripts, there'll be a Lua here. So let's just put one there, right? So now it finds it, and we get the full path to it. I think at this point I want to review Google test to make sure that I understand how it finds files. Because I want it to I want my test runner to operate the way Google test runner does. So let's look at gtest and go there and kind of review what it's doing. Well, it's how it's run actually. Thank you for that follow there. Um Uh, where's the documentation? Here it is. Build instructions, incorporating into a build. Okay. 
when did I decide I wanted to program for a living? Back in high school, I think. So, yeah, I got the I got the command correct. There's that code journey you can read about. So I was inspired to program at a very early age. It just looked really cool, and I started then and never stopped. How do you run? How does Google Test expect to be run? Okay, that's how you incorporate it, but how does it run? Oh, what happened in my game? That happens usually if the server crashes. It has to be restarted. Oh, that's weird. It must have lost connection to Twitch and had to reconnect. Did we have, like, is Twitch misbehaving again today? Oh, yeah, I think maybe. Yep. In fact, I got to restart my um, stream helper because it lost its connection. Hey, Matthew D. Groves with a rate of three viewers. Welcome. My um, stream helper just got disconnected from Twitch. I got to run it again. So, um, hmm. I guess Twitch is having more problems today. Got disconnected from Twitch chat for a little bit there. All right. I'm just going to go with the flow. You got disconnected from chat too? Yeah, I wonder if my um, Yada got disconnected. It doesn't say that it did, but it's it's an awesome chat client. I use Yada for Twitch chat, and it's good enough to not even have told me that there was a problem. <laughs> All right, so welcome, Raiders. If you don't know what I'm working on, there are a bunch of commands that can explain. I'm working on this game, and specifically today, the um, AI scripts like this NPC is using to uh, do things like keep the sewers clean. Like if I move that slime over here, it'll go and kill it. Oh, he did it so fast I didn't even see it. Do that again. There it goes. Yeah, see that? So there's a bunch of Lua scripts in the game to do that, and I don't have a very good unit test framework for that. And I figure I would I would build my own, because my stream is all about building stuff from scratch, because that's what I enjoy doing. Looks like Dragon Quest. It's inspired by Ultima 4 and 5, which are games from the, um, I think it was mid-80s. I'm getting old. I don't remember my dates very well. But it's a very, very old game. That's why the graphics look primitive. Um, it's modeled after that. And also, I'm not a very good artist. So it, it kind of fits my artistic skill level pretty well. <laughs> so it's more of a cerebral game, more text-based, with a little bit of graphics to just give you a visualization of what's going on. But there's a lot of imagination that's going to be involved. Hey there, Ben Sign Games. How are you doing? Yeah, I like to wave at people who chat. So um, that's what that thing is when I'm waving. <laughs> All right, so I'm building up this test runner, and I'm, I was looking to see, I want my test runner to be kind of like Google Test. So I was run, run, we're looking at this to see how is it run. I think it's not described here, right? This is how it's built. Does it have a docs? Aha, here we go, docs. Um, primer, maybe? Why Google test basic concepts, asserts. Okay, but how is it how does the runner work? It it's not in primer. Uh would it be in advanced? Thanks for the follows, by the way. You just need to find the right way to frame it. Everyone asks about your graphics. Yes, yeah, so the way I like to frame it is I say, I admit I'm not an artist, and um I make conscious decisions in my games designed to not require a huge amount of graphics because it would just delay things and it's it's because it kind of goes against the grain of what I want anyway. I want a game that's more cerebral, which is the not the description I came up with, with but some friends have told me that's a good word to use. So more of a thinking and imagination than actual um, artwork. Yeah, so to draw the limited graphics that are there, I use Phaser and it's just tile-based sprites. So this documentation is geared more towards someone who's who's using it, not someone who's run or someone who's 
developing the test to be run, not someone who's calling the test runner. You know what I think I'm going to do? I'm just going to go run Google test on the command line and see what does it do. Um, so I can pick any of my tests. Which one? Which one of these? I don't even know what test one is. Something I wrote a few months ago and on last built it in May. Okay, not that then. How about web sockets test? That's a fun one. So it runs really quickly. Okay, so it's... That's right. It's C++, so it's got to be built in. So there's no searching for paths. So I don't really need to... I don't care what gtest really... gtest won't have anything for locating files. But I will want to look at this stuff later for like how to... Uh, get a list of tests. I'll probably need to use exactly the same argument structure, right? In order to integrate well with the test runner I have. Or the test explorer user interface. Okay, so there's not there's not anything about files. So I can invent my own thing. Let's let's make a default to the current working directory. Um I just don't remember if I ever wrote something like this. Uh, where would I find it? There's git parent directory, git path. There's no working directory thing. Maybe it's because the, I figured that the one built into the standard library was good enough. So that is, if my memory serves, dev docs will help me. That's just CWD, right? Or git. Maybe there isn't a standard one. Um, obviously, it's not that because it's not coming up with the right hit. What if I just search for current working and I get rid of these things? Hmm. Working directory? PWD? Oh, I do have something called PWD. What is that? Oh, that's available on POSIX systems. Where am I using that, though? Interesting. It's not, that's not the same PWD. It's password, I think. Okay, that's not path direct. That's not path based at all. I uh, see CWD in here anywhere. There's that. Actually, I wonder if I can do that with just dot. What does um, list directory do if I just give a relative path? Uh, for example, on Windows, what does it do? I guess I can look it up. I'm going to guess that it works with relative directories. I wish it would just say that explicitly somewhere. I, I think it's just implicit that it's relative to the working directory unless you make it an absolute path. It doesn't even mention it. Okay, I'm just going to assume that I can just make a relative path. So it would be um, just remove the path and just say um, just empty string or dot. Let's try dot. Oop, that was a mistake. Let's see what happens if I do a dot. So, okay, so if I go one directory up and do moon unit, moon unit. It won't work. Right, okay. So um, if I wanted to override that, then let's move this into the um, environment. So it would be standard string. Um, 
search path. Do I want to search more than one path? Oh, let's say that if you want more than one path, you have to run the test runner more than once. That's probably acceptable. So search path defaults to dot. Uh, this is the path to the folder which will be searched for uh, Lewis scripts containing unit tests to run. Wow, I'm terrible at typing today, just like every day. All right, and then we want to um, be able to interpret that, so we'll have um, my rolling my own command line interpreter here. Uh, search path, right? So the initial will be if arg equals, um, just keep it simple. The current, the list that gtest gave was um, all double dashed command line arguments, right? So I can just do the same thing, like double dash path, or yeah, just path. Then a state is search path. Uh, state search path. Um, I don't like the word initial. Let's call this one. Um, no context. And we'll say if state is not equal to state no context. Actually, uh, I want to be ex hold on. This is wrong. I want to actually have another switch on state for um. If you forgot to, if you if you um forgot to have the argument, so case this would be something like return false, and before that do uh my how did a the the thing I copied this from handle this? Did it print it directly to the error? I think it did. Yeah, like this. Why write it when you can just copy it from somewhere else? Default just break. Okay, so path expected for dash dash path option. So let's keep this up to date too and say dash dash path and um, path. And then we'll say what path means here. Options. Path. The relative or absolute path to the folder containing the Lua scripts, the Lua test scripts to, to run. How long is that line? Too long. So I'm going to cut it right here. And do that. I should have done that. All right. Keeping that up to date as it goes is good. So this will get its argument and then go back to no context. So the what we do with the argument is we put it in the, in the environment. Search path is arg. And then down here, I just say environment dot search path. Easy peasy. So now um, when I run it, okay, that's wrong. It shouldn't have done that. It should be have stayed in no context. Oh, I have the wrong thing there. Yeah, my bad. It's if you're still in that state, then you 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 drop the argument, All right? So if I did like path and just ended it, then it would say path expected, right? I should probably <laughs> update that, shouldn't I? Anyway, if I say um, path um, moon unit now, it'll 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 find it. If I say path dot dot realm server source ECS scripts, it'll find all of those. Cool. All right. If I want to be consistent about the path, 
Uh, how do I do that? Is, do I have a utility for shortening the path? Delete directory, create list. I don't think I actually do. This might get me a shortened path. Maybe I could use that. Let me try. Well, actually, I don't know if that'll work. Let me see. Let me see what this does on Windows, for example. Oh, it's agnostic. It just uses whatever path I had there. Okay, so nothing actually shortens the path. All right. Well, I guess I won't sweat it then. So it'll it'll have the dot dots in there if they were in there in the original path argument. Okay. Anyway, now that we are locating the scripts to run. we um, need to do start doing the harder stuff. So it would be bringing them in one at a time. I think what we want to do is make a new Lua state for every file, execute the entire file, and then traverse the global variables looking for certain names that match a certain pattern. That's, that's the idea I have in mind, that, that globals that, have, that start with test would be um, considered unit tests. And then we would just we will get that list at the next level. So I think I need to have something to test the tester, or at least to play around with it. So let me, I want to do that. Maybe at the top level, have another thing called example.lua. And let's say, um, this is an example Lua script with unit tests. that can be located and executed by a moon unit. And so let's have something to test. Um, or should I do true test-driven development, write the test first? Let's write the test first. So the test would be like, what, are the, what is it we're, we're testing? How about something that, um, computes the square, just something easy. So a test square zero equals function end and um, if I want to have fixtures, maybe that would be an argument or Maybe if it's a table with test in front, it would be considered a fixture. So well, let's just start with normal tests for now. So this would be, um, if I want to model it after Google test, I want, it so, I want stuff like, um, excuse me, hold on. Sorry about that. No, he said there's a gtest output that can output XML and JSON. You could look, you could also look at that. I think that's what I need because I'm um, pretty sure that the test explorer UI and the catch2 test explorer thing set uh, JSON output, probably. We'll have to support that. We can actually see what it does. I can have uh, Moon Unit just echo back, I was told to do this and see what it does. Um, yeah, so like local x equals zero, and then local y equals square x, and then, um, should I have a namespace, so to speak, for the tester? I think I do. Let's, let's call it moon unit. Moon unit expect moon unit expect equal uh, zero comma y. There we go. And then something else, another test, test square non zero. And then make that like um, five, expect 25, right? And then the thing that we're testing um, square. I don't know why I had a uh, 
hiccup there in my thinking. Uh, return x times x, right? And if we want to test something that's failing, let's have another function that is... Uh, oh, I can't do the equals, can I? No, I can't. I get my Lua confused sometimes. Actually, no, I, I don't want to do that for a global, do I? I think I... What's this index exactly? Let me look. Uh, that's in Realm Server Source, ECS. I had, like, globals in any one of these. Oh, it's just... F okay, yeah, so it's just function square. Yeah, so I just need to turn this around. There we go. The other way with assignment is if you have locals. Okay, so um How about let's call it buggy? Uh let's have something that gives the wrong answer for something. Buggy absolute value x. And then we'll have um if x is greater than 1 then or less than negative 1 so this is on purpose it's a bug then return negative x else return x right so it will fail so it'll have function test buggy absolute um should pass and then should fail Uh, moon unit expect equal a uh, five for buggy abs negative five, but this one will fail if it's a one. Hey there, seven one five two zero nine. How are you doing? Doing a little bit of a diversion today. I'm setting up, uh, making my own test framework for Lua. So the objective now for moon unit will be when it finds a Lua, it's going to evaluate the script and then look at all globals looking for th for names that start with test underscore and then that will be our list of tests and then once I get that the next thing will be to um to run them all and then we have to have these hooks that um do test expectations so we'll just go with this for now and let me set this up to run correctly. So it would be path dot dot moon unit. There we go. So it finds the example there. And let's have it actually execute. So this is the harder part. I need to actually pull in Lua at this point. Um, I'm just wondering at what point do I, do I need to ref to do I, do I design this correctly to avoid refactoring, or do I just put everything into main and refactor it later? Because I could, I could see myself making another CPP file for the runner, and the main would call the runner once it gets the, the list of files. I think I just, I don't know what I want to do yet, so I'll keep it in main. So, for Lua, uh, I don't want to just write this from scratch. I want to copy from something else I've done this in. Uh, that would be script host. Right, so here's how you pull in Lua. It's definitions. And then um, there's a couple things you'll want to have, like this Lua allocator. So these are like kind of standard machinery that goes with integrating something, integrating Lua into something. An allocator, a reader, and a traceback. Those are really handy to have. So I just I have just been copying those around. So let's just paste them here. So here's a standard Lua allocator. It just wraps realloc and free. This reader just holds on, just um, reads a standard C++ string. And whether or not it's been given the whole thing and it goes along with this reader. Does this reader state only used within Lua Reader? Let 
No, it's used elsewhere, right? Let me see where it's used. Okay, it's used in load script too. Okay, fine. So we provide this function to Lua, so it's used to read something. Read next, right, okay. Then the trace back is to build a nice stack trace. Okay, so here's the part where, which creates an interpreter. I, re I really do strongly st starting to think that I want to wrap this into a class. Yeah, let me do that. So um, back here, we'll have a new file. And we'll call it... Um, I, I kind of want to call it script host, too, because that's what it is. We're going to just call it runner. Let's call it runner. HPP and runner CPP. And I'll move the Lua stuff into the CPP of runner. Uh, and it needs a header of some kind called runner. This module define or implements, contains the implementation of the runner class. We'll, we'll say what that is somewhere else. So namespace, well, I don't know. Don't need a namespace. It's just, that's it, right? Uh, the anonymous namespace and then all the functions that I plopped here, I'm going to pull back out. So all this stuff. Take it and paste it. Okay. And then let's define what the runner is. Runner HVP, this module declares the runner class. And then Uh, class runner. You can't get any more writing from scratch than this, can you? Uh, this class encapsulates all the details concerned with executing Lua unit tests. There we go. Mernon Krasner. You're making a Lua test framework in C++? Yes, that is exactly what I'm doing. 715209. Like the today command says, I'm attempting to set up a unit test framework for the Lua scripts that go into my game. All right. Um, not completely from scratch, though. There's some standard boilerplate that I like these days. This stuff, right? That we have um, life cycle methods. We can say that a runner can be has um, a non-default destructor, and it cannot be copied or moved. That's just to make it easy, right? You can make one, but you can't move it around. Or actually, there's no reason for me to do this. Moving the way I'm going to do it is super easy. So we'll just we'll just declare them, and we'll def. Can I, I can't default them here though. Um, do I need a constructor? I do. We'll make a constructor because we'll have the constructor make the Lua interpreter. And then um, this is really, really standard boilerplate for me. It is that you have um, pointer to impl. Pimple, in other words. And for that, we need memory. Basically, we're saying that the implementation is a separate internal interface called impl that it's opaque at this level, not transparent, and it works because it's in, through indirection. And I've been using unique pointer for indirection, but I think I have reason here to make it shared pointer because... Um, actually, no, there's no reason. <laughs> we'll just leave a unique pointer. Unless you have a reason to make something shared, you should always prefer to, to use unique because it's lighter. We will do that. So then this needs to define that destructor and constructor and move semantics. So we'll destructor first, default it, and it's got the no accept in front. 
And I'm going to do the same thing with the move semantics. I'm going to default it. And it needs to be scoped. And the other, the other half of the move semantics goes there. And then I have to define this structure here. Let's do it here. Runner impl. I don't need to have anything in here. We just need to say uh, this is the internal interface slash implementation of the uh, runner class. One day you'll inter in understand this stuff. I'm, this is the perfect time to ask questions because I'm basically making a new class from scratch. And these are the standard things that I think should go into a C++ class when you have separation between the uh, code and the contract that it obeys. So the runner, its only contract right now is that you can make one and you can destroy it and then you can move it. And it's saying you cannot make a copy of it. And the only, the only other thing in the contract that it says is I need a pointer to my own internal stuff and I don't want to tell you what it is. That's exactly what this is saying. This is saying, I have an internal structure, but I don't want to tell you what it is. There's no body. This says, I need a pointer to it. And we're using the standard library's unique pointer uh, type to, um, to manage that pointer. Do you know anything about C++? See, that's where, th that's the crucial thing where um, if you knew a little bit of C++, you'd be able to follow along. The best I can do is say that this is defining a data type. Um but not giving any details about it. This is just saying, I have a data type, I want to give it this name, but I don't want to tell you what, what, anything more than its name. And then this line is saying, this, um, this, this outer data type needs to have a pointer to this, to, to this inner data type, or this, this inner um, uh, piece of data, and that inner piece of data will, ob will obey the definition of this type that we don't want to give you the details of. And C++, in C++ it's okay to do that as long as it's a pointer. The code that is going to use this pointer doesn't actually need to know any details about the thing pointed to. It just needs to know that it's a pointer. That's good enough. In the implementation then, which needs to know all the details about runner, we have to say exactly what runner impl is. And then we have to say, well, how do we implement these, um, you know, destroying moving or move assignment these are these you can handle the same this is just a lot of syntax and it's saying a very small thing it's saying this is how you move this data this is saying this is how you destroy this data and then i'm, I'm missing one right the construct construct is how you create or what you do to fill in the details of the thing once you've allocated memory for it right that's what that's what that is and because we have a unique pointer we want to um have it point to something, so we'll do it this way. This is called an initializer. We just say, um, make a new one and make impl point to it. New means um, two things. It means allocate memory for a value of that type. And then it also, with these parentheses, it's implying once you've allocated the memory, call its constructor to fill in its details. If you don't define a constructor, one is given to you. Just like if you cannot afford an attorney, one will be appointed to you in a, in a court in the U.S., right? <laughs> if you do not a, define a constructor, one will be provided to you by the, by the compiler. You hang around here more for the logic. Knowledge you can snag? I see. Anyway, if you were just learning C++, this might be useful because I'm kind of giving, giving examples of some of the, of the core mechanics, like destruction and movement. Um... Uh, specification of a type, initialization of an object, that kind of thing. But it's it's really just boilerplate. It has nothing to do with actually running tests yet. I just want to see, can I make one? And actually, let's have it do one minimal thing, which is hold on to the Lua state. Lua. Uh, we can just do that. And we'll say, uh, actually, I've done this before, so let me cheat and find my own documentation for that. Here, where? If I do that with the semicolon, I'll probably find the documentation easier. No? Okay. Why is that? Why did that not find anything? Okay, let me go here, maybe? Oh, I don't even know where it is now. 
script host probably, right? Yeah. Oh, that's why, because I had it defaulted, which is probably what I want to do. And look, I didn't even document it. It's being lazy. I didn't document it. Okay, let's document it. This points to the Lua interpreter that the runner is encapsulating. This interpreter is used to execute the Lua test scripts. There we go. That's what it is. And then, oh, I guess I, I guess we should customize the constructor here. I guess it's better. It's more. It's more correct. So let's just, I'm just going to copy paste this entire thing here. And then one thing I didn't do here that I probably should do: if you define a non-standard destructor, you're supposed to also define what what movement and copying you support. So I will do that. I guess we'll do that after the destructor. So we have to say, um, just like I did for runner, uh, what we allow happen. And I'll just be very blunt here. That we'll say you cannot copy. You can move, but you use it whatever the whatever movement implementation the compiler would generate automatically. So equals delete means it's not allowed. Equals default means it's allowed, and I don't want to use my own implementation, I want to use whatever default the compiler provides. Which is fine as long as everything of data in your structure has its own default movement semantic. If it doesn't, then you get in trouble. The compiler will say, I don't know how to implement that because there's something in there I don't know how to move. Standard is the namespace, yes. std colon colon, uh, where do I use that, for example, in the header file? This... Whenever you see that, it means it's a type or a function that's defined in the standard C++ library. So it doesn't come with the compiler. It's usually a separate implementation, but either bundled with the compiler or or third party. Like Boost is an example of a non of a, of a third party implemented standard library, so to speak. I th although I think they may name it Boost instead of STD. But anyway, it just means it's something that. Um, didn't it's not built into the language but it's usually nearby the language so to speak it's it's bundled with the compiler or um easily attainable along with the compiler but it's yeah not not built into the language it's a it's an actual set of code that someone else wrote that um ends up getting compiled uh, when you build your program usually because they're a lot of these are templates they're not actual um, compiled code, they are recipes for making code. And they are customized for your individual type. That's what a template does. This unique pointer by itself is just a recipe for how to make a data type. Given an argument, which is your concrete um, specialization, I guess you can call it, like what you want to specialize the pointer for is it goes inside the angle brackets. And then together, this is called an instantiation of the template, or a, I think it's right. No, a specialization of the template. Instantiation would be when you um, give it a name in the context of like either another structure or or giving it, um, or you know, putting it in a function somewhere, or asking the memory allocator to to allocate one. All right, so we already pulled in the Lua allocator. We have Lua there. We're creating it there. And I don't have wrapper types yet, but I will. So I'm going to leave. Uh, actually, we're going to have our own link Lua, right? Actually, I'm just going to do it here. Uh, we're going to have, um, yeah, we're going to do it here. I'll just do it later. Okay, and then the destructor Lua closes the opposite of Lua new state. And then that should build. It'll create a Lua interpreter, but just not use it for anything. Did I say it backwards? It's possible. Lua close is the opposite of Lua new state. What did I say backwards, though? Or are you responding to to Rust, the Rust comment, or what Nui said? I actually don't know. Oh, the colon colon throws you off, Krasner? Yeah, it's... You can think of the 
Like if you're familiar with Java or C sharp, it's just like the dot. The comment above yours, which is just like Rust. So it's the other way around. The Rust is the other way around. So yeah, the colon colon is just C++'s version of the dot. So if you're, you, you, you should recognize what a dot is in Java, right? It's just a namespace division. It just says that this type name within the context of this type. So it knows that when I declare this name within the context of this class runner, so this name only means something when it's inside runner. So when you, when you, when you have it outside of the original class definition, you have to say runner colon colon to say it's the impl that's in that's declared within the scope of runner. Same thing with the standard namespace stuff. Unique pointer by itself doesn't mean anything and then until you say standard C standard colon colon and then it's like okay, I'll look within that namespace for that name. So it's really just a naming convention. When this gets compiled, the division between std and unique pointer goes away cuz they're just names. They're just names. Pretty pretty damn simple, yeah. Con basically controls visibility. Yeah, so visibility or scope or context, they're, they're all words that may hopefully give the correct association in your brain to what we're talking about. <laughs> okay, that built, right? So I can run this and make sure it didn't crash. Yay. All right. Now to actually do something with the Lua, uh, let's have it load the script and see if it crashes or not. So instead of printing the path, actually, let's do an addition to printing the path. We will, um, let's say executing and then colon, and then we'll execute it here. And then if it's an, Successful, just say OK. If it fails, then we'll print out a stack trace. So let me pull from script host again, where we do a load. Do I want, do I want load script? Kind of. Yeah, let's make this something runner knows how to do. Oh, and there's no error, what does it do? Nothing. Okay. Just making sure I understood what that does. And do we go here, right? Yep. Runner. Let's declare that. Actually, let me find where I've declared that and see if I've already commented it. Declaration. Oh, I already did it. Yay. Cool. That might be useful too. Anyway, one thing at a time. This method executes. Okay, playing with scissors was trying to train me to remove this unnecessary set of words. So we'll just say execute the given Lewis script. This is the name Lewis script to execute. This is the contents of Lewis script to execute. If there's an error, a description of the error is returned. Otherwise, an empty string is returned. So there we go. Hey there, me Hertz and A squared. How are you guys doing? Hold on a second. I'm just um, updating my um, stream helper. I had to restart my stream helper, and it doesn't remember I I already greeted some people. I had to reload the stream helper because it lost connection to Twitch. I need to update my stream helper so that it automatically retries its connection. I didn't? But you have a kappa there. I have a feeling I did. <laughs> I think I, I think I did. I will compromise. I'll say hi 715209 and I won't put it in chat. I think it's just you being pedantic. Executes. Well, but this is making an imperative. This is like a git comment, a commit comment, right? It's saying, yeah, it's just a different tense. 
the the way I used to do it is I would say this method executes, right? And then playing with scissors pointed out that I have every description begins with this method. So it's extra words I don't need. So I can do that, but this makes it look like we're looks like we're missing a pronoun or something. This is imperative tense and is grammatically correct if you're okay with it being imperative tense. Oh, there's the proof. <laughs> <laughs> uh. All right, anyway, uh, load script. Load script. I think I'm going to just use all this stuff as is, right? Yeah. So then there are only two things that I need to do in main, right? Load the file. And I had a function up here to do that. Read file, right? And I suppose if it's empty, we'll we'll print out that we couldn't that there's nothing that we couldn't read it. Yeah, because it, it shouldn't be empty. That's an unexpected condition, right? So const auto script equals read file file path if script empty then um i guess we're i'm following this sort of standard convention that normal output goes to the standard output and errors go to standard error unable oh. error reading uh a lua script well, not just, not error, error reading. Error reading is fine. I don't really care why it would be an error. If there's an error, I would just look at the script to see what's going on. Uh, I feel like single quotes today. So that would be file path C string. And then read, what do we do here? I kind of want to have it, the return code be important. So let's just keep it Boolean for now. Success is true. Return success. Exit success or exit failure. And we'll just have to say success is false. But continue otherwise, right? Otherwise, uh, we're going to try to load it. So um, I need to have a loader. So this will, instead of listing, it's execute. All Lewis scripts in the configured search path so we're all loading no i decided to do it uh, per file basis right so it'll be a runner so this, in, ha, this has to include the runner and we're going to make one here so runner runner dot load script the name is uh I just want the name part of the file path. Do I have a helper to do that or what? I don't think I did. I forgot how I did that too. Did I have just have it chop off, like find the last delimiter and chop it? I'm just going to keep it the same file path. And the script would be the script. And then it's if it returns something right so const auto uh what is it called there error message if error message empty then print okay else f print f error and then I guess we'll just put it in a string. So error message C string. Standard error. Success is false. Let's try that. This is not Lua. This is a runner for Lua, though. This is C++ Mr. Plus. Your name is strangely appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> 
How are you doing? Oh, I lost my Twitch connection again. I don't even know when that happened. Got to run my uh, stream helper again. Is there is anyone else encountering problems like where they get disconnected from Twitch chat? Because that's happened now twice to me. A couple days ago, not today. Well, for some reason, it's happened to me twice. And I haven't dropped any frames. I'm going to blame Twitch. Okay, what's the problem here? Uh, file. I didn't like file path. Oh, we wanted it into, into a file. Okay, we can do that. File, file path. And then read the file. There. And then... Uh, I thought it was a member. Looks like a member to me. Okay, I don't... Oh, I know why. I didn't actually... Um, no, that should have compiled. So what was the what's the problem here? String is not a member of standard. Ah. Yeah, we should do that. But there's another problem we're going to run into where it can't link, and that's because I forgot to add that to the list of source files. So here we go. Source runner.cvp. And then I kind of feel like I want to separate my headers from my source. So I'm going to do that. Headers includes source. And the reason why it's not in an include instead of source is because it's an internal header. Which is dying again. Could be. I think it's just under stress of some kind. Or it could be that they're developing the production environment. Hey there, Tech Phoenix. How are you doing? Free identifier not found. All right, uh, forget what that is declared in. Um, let's just look it up. It is declared in... Standard lib. Standard lib. What else might I need? String. What else? Probably nothing else, right? Runner is not a class because it didn't include its own header. Cannot be defined in the current scope. Really? Why not? Why can't it be declared or defined in the current scope? I'm missing something. Oh, is it because it's... Yeah, it it should not be in an anonymous namespace at all. All of this should be outdented. Yeah. Syntax error, 175. Indeed. So some extractions is required here. Got it. And what did I use from system abstractions? Printf, okay. So that's in string extensions. It's my own class. If you don't recognize it, that's fine, because it's my own stuff. All right. What do you mean a copy development environment? We have a working environment right here. <laughs> Too many people watching League? Are, are people still watching the sil silly black hole in Fortnite that I still don't quite understand? Or is that done? Anyway, this should run the script now. Okay, so if I wanted to, I could break the Lewis script and test that, right? 
So I can say like, let's just drop the D from the end here. Error, syntax error near function. Okay, so that works. So it loads the script. Now let's, the next challenge will be, let's try to find all of the global variables. Black hole is done. Too bad. Just got disconnected again? My helper is still connected. Why do you use separate variables for header and source file instead of using them directly at add executable? It's just for a personal preference, Nui. I think it's just because I'm used to having them separate. Like if you use an IDE like Visual Studio, they'll tend to like the framework they set up for you tends to keep them separate. There's no real any other good reason. It's just habit to keep them separate. I don't have to. I could just put them straight in here. The fact that I put them in a variable called sources is also a personal preference thing. Yeah, we found having to separate them and really annoying. Well, then you don't need to do it. <laughs> uh, it's up to you. You're, when you develop something, you're in command. Hopefully. Or maybe you're working in a team and you can convince your teammates that you want to do it your way. All right. Um, yeah, so next is to find these global variables. So... I think what we'll do is we'll try to wrap up main. Maybe what I'll do... Well, no. Um, main has to have some control over the, what the runner runs, right? And I want it to be modeled after what gtest does, which is what? I don't know why I would do that one or shuffle. I don't, I don't think I need that. It's this one, right? List. I, I might need to list the tests. So I know what we should do. We should have, we should just make the next one be a list. So um, instead of, well, I guess in addition to the OK, no, in addition to the OK, we will um, list out the, the methods that we found, if we have any, right? So let's get, let's get a list. Test, tests, right? Or test names. Yeah, test names. Get runner dot get test names. And then if test names empty, let's print something special. We'll have it print um, no tests found. Otherwise, we'll print tests and then uh, iterate over them. Const auto test name in test names. A little s test name c string. All right, so just need to have this get test names declared. Vector string get test names const. Sounds good to me, right? So we need vector. And let's document this. See, yeah, I think Twitch is having connection issues. I don't think my game is crashing when the chatbot does, does that. It's just reestablishing its connection to Twitch when that happens. Yeah, it must have gotten disconnected. So if people are just randomly being disconnected today, I guess. That sucks. So my in-game Twitch connection reestablished its connection, but my my chat helper does not. I have to manually restart it. Exactly. Mr. Destructoid. Because it's a bot, right? It's got to declare that it's a bot. All right. Uh, return the names of all tests found in the script. Well, all tests found. This... You could call this multiple times and then have multiple tests. If some, I don't want to make the requirement that you only call this once. I want to kind of leave it loose. So the um, collection of na names of tests found is returned. Should we be specific here? Lua tests? I guess so. Yeah, and then don't need to see the details there. We're implementing this. 
I think we'll just, at this point, do a scan of the global. So, did I do this somewhere else? I think you have to use the Lua. It's the G, it's the G global, right? So get, not get user value, it's um, get global. That's what it is. Pushes onto the stack the value of global names. So I want to do um, Lua get global impl Lua um, G. And in the end, we're going to do a Lua pop. Make sure I did this right. Writing parsers is resident sleeper. I, I kind of like parsers. Maybe I'm just weird. Nui is Thanos. Snap, Nui snaps their fingers, and all of a sudden, everyone gets disconnected from the chat. <laughs> Yak. I've used Yak before. Just really quick, let me show you the yet the la the last Yak file I did. It was in Data Disintegrator. It looks it's in the uh, formatting. Here we go. Here's the Yak file. Can I actually tell this it's Yak or? black or something. I, I guess it's not built in. This is a yak file or bison. Actually, does not know about bison? No, it doesn't. It's um, a syntax description, including um, like you define all of your operators, your your tokens, and then you have your grammatical rules. So it, it, this is this is what statements are. An individual statement has a body. Here's how, so I, this is when you define your own language and you want to use uh, a um, parser generator to, to build the compiler for it. So I made one of these not too long ago. And the CS compiler class came in handy too. Just had to brush dust off that old book, so to speak, pick it up. All right, getting the test names. So if that's on the Lua stack, then uh, that had a way of iterating over an array, right? It was calling Lua next. I thought. Hmm. Is it? No, it wasn't next. I guess I, do. I haven't written it. Hold on, no, I, have, I had something for JSON wrapper. It was like object. Yeah, this one. What does this do? Oh. That's so that it used method meta methods. Or maybe there is no Lua next. Is that why? Well, there is a Lua next. Why didn't I just do that? Why did I bother doing Lua call instead of Lua next? Maybe I didn't know, I didn't realize I could just do Lua next. Or is there some reason why I did it this way? That's the equivalent of calling Lua next, right? I do have to push something on the stack at first. Well, I'm already pushing something on the stack there. Yeah, so let me take this and clean it up. Actually, I need to come back and clean that up too. Because I think I don't need to get global next and push value. I think I just do Lua next. Well, instead of the Lua call, just do Lua next, right? And then the index is what? From the given index. So I need to push an index. So the first one's nil. So that'll be um, negative one then, right? Wait a minute. It's going to pop the key and then pushes the key value pair from the table at the given index. What? Oh, it's the table. Okay, so then that's negative two. Huh. <laughs> 
So that's the key, and then that's the index of the table itself. So that's iterating the globals. And then I want to do that in a loop. So while that is not equal to zero, because zero means nothing. Yeah, just like their example shows. I should have just done that before. And then they push two on the stack. That's what that plus, plus two zero means that you guys can't see because it's too far over there. So let me fix that. This means it pops one and either pushes two or zero on the stack. It's going to push zero if there was no more elements in the table. Otherwise, it's going to push two things. A, uh, what does it say? I guess it's a key and then the value. The key is at negative two, the value is at negative one. Okay. And then they're using the trick where they just pop the value and they use the key for the next iteration. I like that trick. So we'll do the same thing. So the key is... Alright, keys can be anything in Lua. So Yeah, because we could have globals. Well they they should all be strings, right? All the keys should be strings. I think they should all be strings. I guess we'll do this with a check, right? And then um the value uh we don't care about. So or at least not yet. Let's just list all the globals at first. So we'll just add that to our list that we have to make. So we'll make a list here, test names, and then we'll end up returning it. And then here we'll push it. So test names. Actually, I guess I can do an in place, right? In, um, in, how come that's not helping me out with the suggestions? Probably because I don't have vector. Well, the vector should be inherited from here. No, IntelliSense is just broken. <sighs> I think it's in place back as long as you um, do it this way. And then um, we're just going to pop one. And at the end, I'm just popping one. And then I have to have this in front of all my Lewis, don't I? Blink, 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 paste. So the compiler I made was for my own custom language. So it, it, it came out of an idea I had at my last job too, um, for parsing multimedia files, you, uh, it, it, it came from the idea that um, the MPEG group had when they were specifying, I think it was MPEG 4 or 2, one of those two. The syntax got, or the, the um, yeah, the data syntax got so complicated, they started describing it in terms of pseudocode. And so I took the step of, well, if it's, if it's already pseudocode, why not just write a compiler for that pseudocode and then that compiler pulls in basically a format description for, for an MP4 file, for example, and then using that compiled specification, it can then parse an MP4 file, knowing nothing other than the compiled syntax that it just, that it just figured out. Compiler add.py to the file name. That's not a compiler's job. <laughs> Okay, why did it do that? I'm missing something. Ah, I see. There we go. Cool. All right, so let's see if that what that does in this window. So those are all my globals. So in there should be the tests. There we go. And it didn't crash. So that means all the keys are strings in the in the G table which is great. So what's interesting is since it G is itself a global, it self-references. <laughs> so I guess then we just narrow it down to everything that begins with test, right? So if, well, let's just define static const standard string test prefix. Is that right? And then static 
const size t. Test prefix length is test prefix dot length. If well, let's that means I need to change this. So we're gonna get the string out first. Uh, const standard string key is that if key dot length is greater than or equal to test prefix length and key substring zero comma test prefix length equals test prefix then can't in place back yet uh, or anymore because we've already made it how come I can't hit tab there? I, uh, go away. It won't. Tab is broken. Tab doesn't work anymore. How annoying. What did I do that? Okay. Stupid editor. Go away. <laughs> G-test out output compatible. That's what I'm trying to do. Yeah. I want to just uh, integrate it into my current workflow. So that when I run my unit tests, they'll include testing my Lewis scripts as well. And then I'm making this open source if anyone else bothers or you know wants to use it. You think it tabbed on the sidebar? No, but I kept clicking here to put the context back. See, whatever it was, yeah, it's not worth my time figuring out what I did. I'll just move on. So um, push back, but we don't want to make a copy. We'll just say it takes over the key at that point. There we go. Yeah, it's fancy. Look at those custom ligatures. All right. So now we've narrowed it down to just the tests. Isn't that nice? Something blue on the left lit up when I hit tab. I don't know what it was. <laughs> yep, ligatures. You always forget what they're called? Yeah. I don't know how I remember. I just remember that they're ligatures. Um, so that's it for test names. I don't know. This is probably a good, a good checkpoint to have, right? So we'll say um, add code to scan execute and locate all Lua tests. We've gotten quite far. The um, next step is what? Looking at the example, the main program will pick which tests to run based off of either the default would be all of them or we might have a, a filter with, I guess, what will we use? Um, it's like a primitive form of regular expression. I wonder if I could just use regex. Oh, and we'll want to um, we'll have we'll have s multiple patterns, and you might have negative patterns. Huh. I can just see how the framework is calling it. <sighs> so yeah, anyway, um, oh, they, look, they misspelled positive. Someone open a f bug ticket with Google. <laughs> Positive, positive patterns. Uh, anyway. Yeah, so once they're identified, we're going to tell, I guess we'll tell the runner to run, I guess we'll tell it to run one at a time. So it'll be like run each test. So let's just have the default be that it runs them all. So we don't need to say tests anymore. We're going to actually print out the name of the test. And we won't need OK anymore, right? Let's put OK, no tests found up front. Actually, let's just see no tests found. And then here it'll be print the test name and then we'll tell the runner to run it. So runner, well, and it could either pass or fail, right? So success, basically if it fails, if not runner run test, test name, then success is false. 
Um, actually, we want to put this up front, right? We want to have a positive case as well. And let's do this this traditional way where we don't end the line yet. If we get here, then we'll print OK and terminate the line. Actually, how does how does gtest run runner look like? Oh, they do it that way. And I wonder how they do the colorization. I wonder if it actually matters. Probably not, because I bet the way that the test explorer UI runs it is it probably gets an XML or JSON output. Don't forget to create a test unit test to check that spelling error. <laughs> it's no such thing as, yeah, you just don't need to be consistent in your misspelling until they change the dictionary. Right? You, you ain't gonna give up until ain't ain't in the dic I mean, is in the dictionary. Whatever, whatever. <laughs> I'll worry about formatting later. So, and right now we'll just say Adam pass and Adam fail. It's a reference to Adam 13531. If only I could have it actually show the emotes in the console. That would be cool. You append a .json or .xml to the output file? Well, no, I have to actually generate the correct format. Uh, I, you, you mean how it's specified, how the runner is told to use that format, right? Code doesn't throw errors for bad spelling except for Rails. It hates pluralization. Yikes. Okay, so run test we don't have yet. Okay. That is next. Bool run test. Standard string. Test name. It is technically not const. It can mutate the environment, so that's what we're going to do. Actually, I wonder if we're going to want a new interpreter for every time we run. I'll deal with that later. It could be that load script loads it and then caches the script and name and then when we and then maybe collects the test names but then abandons the Lua interpreter and then every run test will make a new interpreter because we might want a fresh environment for every test, right? Yeah, but I'll worry about that later. Um, that's all in the internals anyway, right? So execute the uh, Lua test with the given name test name this is the name of the lua test to execute return an indication of whether can't type today whether or not the test succeeded is returned or test passed collapse paste zoom enhance all right. So I think what we need is a equivalent of a Lua P call. I mean, a, a, we need a Lua P call at this point. Lua P call. Oh, I already have that. Oh, for load script, but we already have it loaded. So it's a specialization of this, right? It's this thing, I think. Well, is that right? Maybe that's right. Yeah, just call a function. Get back if it had an error or not. Sort of. Okay, if there's an error, then that's a special kind of fail, right? That means the the test didn't even, couldn't even um, finish correctly. Yeah, okay, I think I know what I want then. There won't be arguments, right? Why do I have that? What is that from? Oh, that's meant for you can push stuff on the stack at first and then call it, but I don't need that. So it's going to be zero. So just push the trade back, push the trace back function. 
And then what's this in... Oh, put it in front. Okay, so we don't need that. It's already in front. Get... So the get global by the name gets the function onto the stack. And then we're... I, I don't need to insert because it's already in front, right? And then we call it. There are no arguments, no return value, and one is where the traceback is located. If it's not okay, we get an error message. What if it's not okay and it... Why do I even have that check? Hold on, let me see. Have I done this before? Several times. Why am I always doing that and not... This seems like, what if Lua is nil and the result is not okay? Like, I'm never doing that. Why, why do we even have that check then? Uh, is that just a, a null check to make sure that this doesn't crash? But this realistically never happens? I guess I can look and see what does Lua P call actually do. What does it do on return? Which is the single returns an error code. Returns an error code. Always removes the functions. Message handler. This function will be called the error object, and its return value will be the object returned on the stack. So there's always something. So I'm always returning something from Lua stack trace, right? Trace back. Right. Actually, no, I'm not. If the message... Why do I have a two string and then not is none or nil? Oh, that's if it's not a string, see if it can be converted to a string. If so, try to do that. But if all else fails, call that. So yeah, it's not always getting returning a string, is it? It's kind of falling through, like if the return value was nil. But they said it would always be an error object, right? Hmm. There are logic paths here where, we're, where we will return something that is not a string. Maybe they're just not practically possible? Uh, anyway, I'm getting tired of looking at that. I'm just going to leave it. <laughs> if there's a problem with that, it's a problem in four places, five, six, seven places, and we'll fix it some other time. Out of curiosity, why is it matching here and here separately? Wait a minute, why is that open in two different... Oh, look at that. Lowercase u, it thinks this is a different file. Let's close that one. Fixed. Weird. Anyway, um, yeah, anyway. If it failed... Let me turn this into a positive case. Because we'll want to um, return hopefully true, and this one will always return false, right? Uh, but I need that done. Actually, I don't really need to do that as long as I pop the return value, right? This says don't return anything, but we will return. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'll just do a Lua pop here.
and then I don't need to do those. So, what do I do with the error message, though? I have an idea, and that is that we make it uh, an output parameter. Error message. Uh, is this what I want? I think I don't want... There's actually... It's not a Boolean thing, right? Or maybe, maybe it is Boolean. It's either pass or fail, and then the fail will just will tell the user what it is. Um, which means I can just make it return an error message, and if it's empty, it passed. Yeah, why, why not? Let's keep it simple. If the test passed, an empty string is returned. Otherwise... A human readable explanation of the failure is returned. Hopefully. How's the game coming along? It's okay. I am still building stuff from scratch. So, today is a slight diversion because in my game, I am writing more and more Lua scripts for things like the game's uh, AI scripts. Like, what controls... The monsters and the NPCs, and I ran into difficulties last week with debugging and realized one of the things I'm missing are extra tools to support the development of those Lewis scripts. And I thought I could I could make a I'm into unit tests or test driven development making unit tests, so and, and it doesn't seem that hard to make a test runner for Lua. So that's what I'm doing today. Um since I like to do stuff from scratch, I'm showing how it's done. Practically if uh if I was um in a team at a, someone else's company and I just needed to get it done and I wasn't showing this on Twitch, I wouldn't do this. I would pick up some unit test framework for Lua and just use that. Yep. Hey there, Calo Creation. How are you doing? You should check out Calo Creation's stream. He's working on um, integration stuff between uh, his stream and Twitch and all sorts of things. He's also in the same uh, team I'm in now, uh, Live Coders team. So we're both relatively new team members, but it's a very large and growing team. I think we're at like, last count, it was like 91 streamers in Live Coders. And our team is all about showing coding live, answering questions, sort of teaching whenever the teaching moments happen. People ask questions, we try to answer them, and just be enthusiastic about coding and technology in general yeah go team go team <laughs> all right uh run test it's gonna return a string now which that means i guess i can go back to what i had before i can just say if it's not equal do that and then return error message there we go thanks for that follow by the way You know what I'm gonna do? I oh, know I'm just gonna leave that. This this looks weird. That this looks wrong. Like what if it's nil? But I don't think it's possible for it to be nil. I think I only did that because I was really nervous. Because if it is nil, that will throw an error. Um, or will it? I actually don't know. Anyway, <laughs> I'm thinking too deeply about it. Let me just move on. Run test will return an error message. What are we gonna do with it? Uh, right, we're going to get the error out. So this becomes a const. Actually, we can just reuse error message, can't I? I can say that equals that if error message dot empty. We pass as long as I don't make that constant anymore. Cool. So I'm sure these will all fail now because the example uses these integration functions I haven't defined yet. Uh, wrong terminal. Add and fail. There we go. Fail, fail, fail. Uh, we should print out Y, though. Uh, let's print that out next. Um, It's going to standard error, which could be a different file, so we should probably print we should probably print the name of the test. 
standard error test failed so that is test name c string an error message c string let's try that you like the lua integration it makes prototyping a lot faster yeah that's why i'm using it uh it doesn't mean i have to use it people have asked why not to do it in c++ i could do that i would just need a dynamically load dynamic load of dynamic module loading framework in my game i don't have that there we go so that's what i expected now does it look nice i think it does this is probably enough context i don't have to say the name of the file So then the next step is to make these uh, support functions. Let me think about this. Could I just make it as simple as compare their quality and if they're not equal, just do Lua error? Just manufacture a Lua error of some, some sort? Hey there, Ann Perry. Doing well. How are you doing? I have been stretched in two and a half hours, though. Feel my neck popping when I do that. Don't print Y, then your tests also become a game. Someone tweeted that the other day, like there's uh, an extension you can install in some continuous integration system that makes all your tests pass. <laughs> do a backflip. I can't do a backflip, but I can, I can pop some of the joints in my back. <laughs> all right this requires a global user data which has a meta table that has an indexer that lets this map to a c function so that's what i want to do next uh we need to um make the global and map it so i'm going to do that in runner when we uh, set up the context here, right? Initialize wrapper type. So, and I'm not going to do it from scratch completely. I'm going to do it from some other work I did. Uh, where was that? I'm, let me look for the the string game and look in. Here it is. No. Nope. Ha. Here it is. Lua new meta table. And then if it's self-indexing, it index points to itself, which is fine. There we go. We're going to call this moon unit. How do you guys who haven't been here that long in the, or today, what do you think of that? That's the name I came up with for unit testing Lua scripts, because Lua is uh, Portuguese for moon. And moon unit is the name of a singer. <laughs> I don't know why I get, so amused by that anyway um it is totally against what my viewers wanted to i sort of i'm a rebel today so this would be uh lua expect equal and then at the end doesn't it pop something yeah it pops and then we're done right i don't need to have a finalizer or anything so then i just need to like grab the prototype and pull it here. I should have a designated area. This is properties. And these are methods. And just put it after here. And this is low expect equal. And here's what we're going to implement here. So it's going to expect two arguments. But really, it's just going to end up calling equal, e equals on them, right? Uh, how do I do that in Lua? Equal? Compare? Compare. Compares two Lua values. So I need to have an operator. Okay, there we go. So it's Lua compare. It's going to return something. Returns one if it satisfies the operation. Okay, so if... 
Uh, Lua compare, Lua comma, uh, ne uh, negative one and negative two, right? The two things on the top of the stack, and then the th argument is Lua op equal. And it's if they're not equal, we're going to do something, right? Uh, Lua error, is that what I want? Just something simple for now. I might decide to do something more advanced, like w mark that the test failed, but then continue. But I think right now we'll just keep it simple and we'll error out right away. Uh, there was... Aha, here we go. Raises an error with some arguments. So I want Lua L error. Lua, and then this is a printf styled format string, so we'll say... Uh... How do you get to string? Aha, that's what I want. So something like, actually I can put it in line, right? I can say we're going to have two arguments and we're going to convert to string the two arguments. And the expected one is first. So that will be negative two because they're pushed in order. Depends what Lua compare does. Huh. It's really not clear, but I'm guessing... Oh, wait a minute. No, it's the f order for this, so... There's something I'm missing. Um, because I decided to call it through as a method, the first argument will be itself, so I should check that. Uh, where did I do that? Was that this? No, it was like check you data. There we go. That's what I did. That's if we need a uh, reference to our impl. So that's impl check you data that it is a moon unit. And I didn't make the global moon unit, did I? I meant to, but I didn't. That was here, right? Where was that done? Where does it actually set it as a global? This is setting up the meta table, right? Where does it do set global? Oh, there it goes. Uh, what is that? That's what I need. Yes. I need that. We're going to do that. Um, can I do that at any point? So I can do that here. And then, yeah. And just needs. To, so instead of popping, I can just do that at the very end. Right? No, I want to pop. That's constructing the meta table. That's constructing the global. There are two separate things. So let's make this um, another comment. Uh, construct the... Uh, and this has to be moon unit. I'm guessing these can be separate. This is a global name and that's a meta table name. Construct the moon unit singleton representing the runner. There's Son Goku. I've never seen you before. Hello. Making a little uh, test framework for Lua today. All right. So that should just check that it's there. John Games, you've hosted me for one viewer. Welcome, John Games. Uh, yeah, so this is... Oh... Right, the convention is positive numbers, so this would be 2 and 3, right? Left and right, so this would be... L the left is the expected, and the right is the actual. So it's something... We say something like, expected that actual was that. And that'll include a stack trace, so that... Let me try that out. Uh, I didn't like that because there is no impl. There we go. 
Must return a value, right? We're returning zero. Nothing. Okay, let's try it. Index a nil value global moon unit. So that didn't work. So I didn't set the global correctly. Oh yeah, it didn't set. I didn't forgot the. I forgot the last step. Set global. There we go. Hmm. Oh, it's always the top right. So it's both named moon unit and has the moon unit meta table. Actually, I wonder if I could instead of popping it, I can just do set meta table. Skip a pop. Set meta table. Yes, pops a table from the stack and sets it as the new meta table for the value at the given index. Oh, so it's backwards. Shoot. Because this has meta table first and then value on top, but this wants me to have the meta table on top. I'll just leave it the way it is. Oh, there we go. So it worked. Failed. Expected one actual was negative one. That's where it should have failed. I set that up in advance earlier. So at 33, right? There we go. That was an expected failure. Should fail. Should fail, failed. Nice. Hey, we're almost done. <laughs> the, the rest of the work will be to refine this and have more um, variations on this. Uh, let's have let's have a combined here. Should fail and stop. Should fail but continue. And the difference will be this will be an assert and this will be an expect. But either way, we'll have something that it does second, right? And then when we run it, um, actually, how do we know? It continued. Oh, we don't. Let's have it repeat this one. Let's have it do it twice. So this one we should only see this fail, but not that. And this one we should see two failures. So expect is acting like an assert right now. So let's fix that. So we'll have both an expect and an assert. And then, uh, where is it? Let's expect, let's make an assert. So we want assert to act with the Lua error. I think what I want expect to do is, um, instead of Lua L error, I want to somehow mark that the current test has failed. But, and then print this. So this ultimately is going to be an F print F. It's a standard error, but otherwise continue. So, uh, but I need to mark it that it failed. So how do I do that? Run test is doing everything in the context of that P call. So I could just make a flag associated with the runner. That'd be the easiest. So something like bool current test failed false this flag is set if any test expectation check fails and then um, we need to make sure to clear it before so where's run test here it is so right here that's false and then um, this this path of failing is if the call fails, but if the call succeeds, but it was a marked failure, that's different, right? So we have, we should have a check here. And we can say error message. I don't know what we want to say. G Google test doesn't operate like this. I think the way they do it is um, 
that every, well, let me think about this. This is expecting that there'll be one and only one failure if it fails, and I'm changing that. So I wonder if I should up modify this back to Boolean again. Either that or have um, callbacks, that there's something we can call to report an error. I'd rather just do a Boolean. So let me move this back then. Auto knots. Huh. Task failed successfully. That's funny. <laughs> I'll have to check out this game. Auto knots. Interesting. Okay, so it's not this anymore. It'll just be if it returns true, then pass, otherwise fail, and success is false. And then run test now returns just a, a boolean. If, okay, an indication of whether or not the test passed is returned. That's what it used to say anyway. And then we should maybe say here, any test Failed expectations? Any problems with the test will be reported to the standard error stream. Something like that. Okay. So this becomes bool. This becomes... Uh, let me think about this. If it's okay, then we want to check this, right? And return false. Actually, that just means we're returning not current test failed. Else, we're always returning uh, false. And I, anyone, and I want to print out that error message, so I guess that's in here. Um, F printf standard error. Do I want to say like error then the thing? Probably. We'll see what that looks like in a minute. And then we return from both paths, so that's fine. Okay. Try it out. Current test fail undeclared identifier. That's because this is an impl. Expected one, actual was negative one. Okay, I need a new line at the end, looks like. Hmm. All right, let's fix the new line thing first. There's a couple problems in formatting that I see. I need new lines here. Right, we get a stack traceback because it was an assert. But there's a formatting problem, like this atom fail should go up um, here, and on, all the errors should, pers pers should go, go after that. So I guess instead of do going to the standard output, we need to like collect these and print them afterwards, right? And maybe, do I want a stack traceback for everything? How do I get a stack traceback for if we don't do error? Do I just do a manual traceback? Let me see. Because this did it, right? Yeah, it just did Lua. Let's see what this does. What does Lua L traceback actually do? Creates and pushes a traceback of the stack. The level parameter tells at which level to start the trace. So I don't know what level. What level am I been doing? One. I I don't know what that means. I don't know what level. I guess one is what we want. 
<laughs> I mean, let's just try it. So if I want to just get in extra info in the X in the expect, right? That would be um here. Uh, would I just do that? I'm guessing. Let's try it. It didn't like it because that does not take one argument. Oh, is that not, that's not an arg, oh, that pushes it on the stack, so. Yeah. It's an int. It's the wrong kind of thing. Also, message is undeclared. Oh, that's nothing, right? No extra message in front. Is that null? So null, I can use null. And you can have multiple stacks by Lewis state. So it pushes it on the stack. So I need to call that and then extract it back off. Um, is it two string? Yeah. Like this, right? Well, is that what, is that what I do in the P calls? Yes, I do that. And then I pop it. So I always have pushed something. So yeah, I can just do this then. And then um, Lua pop Lua one. And then no impulse in front. There we go. Oh, sleep well, 715209. Sorry, I'm putting you to sleep. But maybe that's a good thing. You've had a long day. So I do get two stack traces, but I get a pass at the end. That's not good. Oh, did I wipe out the um, flag that this was setting before? By mistake? No? When do I set? Did I never set that? I think I never set it. Yep, I never set it, so I need to set that up here. Uh, and there's where we're using the self, actually. Uh, why did that not work? Why are there no suggestions? It should suggest current test failed. Unless I have a problem here. We have a problem, compiler? No problem, it's just IntelliSense won't help me today. Oh, we got a crash. Heap corruption detected. <gasps> Yikes! Re, re, heap correction. Okay, where might I have heap corruption? Oh, this self is not correct. Oh, I don't know why. Because I believe it's a double pointer. And I copied that from somewhere else where it was picking self up from a a non in a a wrapper that was only single level in direction. Yeah, that's it. So here. Fail on that one. Pass pass fail on the assert. And then there's another pass. One, two, three there are five tests. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. All right, now I just need to clean up the formatting here. Uh, looks like the stack trace does not end in a new line. So I have to do that, I guess. Well, I can, hmm. This is not a formatted, so I really should do that to format it. And what's wrong there? Eh, oh, comma. There we go. Okay, looking better. I just need to get... It's hard for me to see the Adam pass. So I'm going to, even though I like Adam a lot, I'm going to, um, instead of saying Adam pass, I'm going to make it easy to see. Pass or fail. So we can see 
yeah, this I kind of wanted to to go up there. So instead of doing fprintf, I think what we're going to do is we're going to collect all of the output somewhere and then print it at the end. Yeah, aw, I know. Um, I don't need to change these printfs though. I think what I want to do is after either pass or fail, we're going to want to see if there is a buffer of diagnostics or errors, right? Because we'll use it for non-error diagnostics too. Maybe check marks. I just need to, we just need to make a font that has emotes and we can put Adam's emotes in there. To use a code runner C, C++ extension, yeah. The one I use is called uh, Catch2 and Google Test Explorer, which requires Test Explorer UI. So the goal for me today, I don't know if I'll get done on time. Maybe. The goal for today would be that my tests show up in this list and I can run them just the way I can run any of these tests, right? That I can just click go and it shows me the this passes or fails. It would be super cool is if I could click that and it actually goes to the Lua and it would be super, super cool is if I had these little buttons. Not the debug, I just need the run and the show log. Um, for all my test functions here in Lua. That would be super sweet. Yeah, so for for the C, C++, I use um, Google Test with those extensions. Test Explorer UI, Catch 2 and Google Test Explorer. It's super sweet because it's got quick-to-run buttons, show log, I can debug if I want any individual test. Super quick, and I don't have to worry about setting up a debug... Um, configuration or anything like that so it's co pretty cool so back to this check x or unicode yep okay see ya son goku thanks for hanging out here all righty all righty so instead of these instead of that I need to take over what, what this, what does that actually do? I can actually go and look at it and see what it does. Can't I? If IntelliSense would be so helpful, no, it's not gonna be helpful. I gotta do this myself. Um, it's probably ignoring Lua. Let's have it not ignore Lua. And then we'll go into here. Here it is. Oh. I know what it's doing, yeah. So I I know how to f change this. It is going to um, get hit into here, this printf, which is fine. So oh, thanks for that follow. Um, so that f printf and these two f printfs, we will instead of going to the standard error, we're going to put them in a buffer of some kind. So that's not hard to do. Well, just along with our uh, variable that we had for current test failed, I can have a vector of strings, diagnostics. <gasps> Rally monkey, 13 months? I thought she was 12 months, like just last week. Wow, 13 months. That's more than a year. Impressive. Impressive. Most impressive. But you are not a Jedi yet. <laughs> it's almost a year. <laughs> it's almost, uh, uh, what is it? I don't know my planets well enough. Is there a planet who has, which has more than 12 months in a year in its period around? I guess all of them have more than 12. What am I thinking of? But they're a lot longer than 12, right? Like a uh, Martian year is um, probably like two and a half years. Like that. Anyway, fantasy worlds. There we go. I know. Rally Monkey, another founder. Okay, this is uh, where uh, error output and other messages to be displayed if a test fails. This is where we keep. Error output and other messages do to be displayed if an error fails. There we go. So then uh, we need to clear it here. 
clear clear and then um when i suppose what we can do is uh we can have another method to fetch it or do we just want to print it all at the end i think right now i'm just going to print it all so that means i don't want to return yet we'll say bool test pass pass actually i don't even need to do that i can just do this at the end and um this goes back to that and um this will set that and um this will just append so um diagnostics uh push back But it's going to be a standard move, right? Because I'm going to do a system abstract. I'm getting no help from IntelliSense. S printf, and then this stuff. And let's be nice and wrap those two. Okay. And then when I want to do the same thing uh, out here, here. So that goes there. And this replaces that there. Yeah. Oh, wait a minute. No, hold on. I'm uh, missing a part. This part. That should be self diag. Oops. That was horrible. Push back that. All right. And same thing there. All right, and then, um, oh, hold on. I can't print it. I have to return it somehow. Shoot. I think I'll have to have a method to extract it. Most planets have more than 12 Earth months in the year. Yeah, because they go slower. It's, it, it's, uh, they're further out, so it's more space to traverse. System abstractions. I think that works. Oh, abractions. You're right. A squared. I missed a parenthesis somewhere. 231 up here. It's commonly misspelled. There we go. Yep, pasted. Copy pasta kills me every time. All right. Yeah, I think we're not going to print them. We're going to have another method to get it because we want to print that and then check. So const auto um, extra or diagnostics is um, runner get last test diagnostics. If not diagnostics empty then we're going to do um i already have it formatted so i just want to write it what is that it's like is it just write how come i'm drawing a blank it's like i don't want to format it so i don't want f print f i want like f is it just f right f right just f right right yeah just f right, and we don't care about the return value. F right. Uh, the buffer comes first, so that's diagnostics um, data. Diagnostics length. And it's one of it. And then f uh, standard error goes next. Cool. I think that's right. I just need to make this a uh, method. Const. Okay. Return. Well, this can be a reference, right? K. 
can it though? Hmm, I don't know. I don't feel like good about making a reference. So let's just say return a copy of any diagnostic messages generated by the the last uh, test run. A ta copy of any diagnostic blah blah blah. Okay. Exactly. Okay, good. Good, good, good. Paste. I feel like I'm getting there, although if I want it to be like completely comprehensive, I'm going to need a lot more assert and expect macros and stuff. Uh, this is just return impl diagnostics. And IntelliSense has failed me today. Oh, because it's not a string. Correct. It is a vector of strings. Correct. And then the main will need to be changed. So it's if... Actually, empty still works, right? So it's going to be a loop for const auto line in the diagnostics. And are they going to be null terminated? Don't... I guess we did, right? We did make them null terminated, so it's just an F right of the line. All right. I think that worked. Now we can have nice little barriers if we want. So we can do F, print F, because I'm lazy. Um, mm. How about just a bunch of dashes? Okay, that's missing a new line. Okay, that's in the um, it's it's in this one. Where is it? Not the it's in runner. It's right here, right? Uh, not that one. That one has a stack. Oh, that one has a stack trace attached to it, so it is an, It is that. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Now it's getting readable. Now we can see that there are two things that failed, and we can see um, a nice printout of the expectation and the line numbers are correct. So that's another thing I didn't verify. Those lines thirty-eight, thirty-nine, are they correct? Yes. Nice. Hey there, Coden Moore. How are you doing? So yeah, I'm making a Lua a test framework and a unit test framework, and it's working. So I have a test runner that discovers and runs tests, and the ones that should fail fail, and the ones that should pass pass. So now I want to get it to where it works with um, the uh, the extensions I use in VS Code. So there are a couple, I'm going to be sneaky about it. What I'm going to do is I'm going to actually tell it to to run it. And then um, just by trial, just by just by having it run it, we'll see what command arg line arguments the actual test, the, the, the extensions expect. So that means I want to go to this main and kind of capture what the, what the, um, what the um, command line arguments were. So let's uh, let's temporarily hack this thing right here. Um, yeah, I think I just want to put something in here that um, prints it to a file of some kind. So let's just. We're, we're, I don't care about making this pretty. Let's just do um, f open. How does that? How does that? It's been a while. I can't remember f open. There's a copy beardy. I'm uh, Raimu, a.k.a. Half Silver Beardy. <laughs> <laughs> you're, 
You recognize the stream parrot chat? Yeah, that's made by our very own CM Griffin. I'm alpha testing it for him, uh, along with some other streamers as well. And it, this is the Golden Age comics format, which seems to be popular amongst viewers. How are you doing today, Copper Beardy? By the way, Copper Beardy is a recently addition a recent addition to the same live coder stream, a team that I'm in. And so you should check his stream out. He's obviously a, a really cool streamer because he's in our team. <laughs> I think most of the time, though, uh, I haven't been able to check out Copper Beardy's stream, but I'm sure it's excellent. How do you remember things and take notes for programming? I have a big notebook. And as I'm learning stuff, even while I'm streaming, I'll collect notes. The challenge for me has always been to organize my notes. No one note helps in that if like I for totally forget when I wrote something down, I can search for it. So I can say like the word takeaways is something I searched for earlier today. I'm like, oh yeah, there's where I put that list. Uh, so one note's really cool in that it can help you find things when you're not so good at organizing. I think the first step of remembering things is if you can't memorize it, just write it down somewhere in a in a in an organization technique. At, the, at least allows you to find the information, even if it isn't pretty. What's the game look like so far? I can show you. So uh, we'll show you from a player's point of view. Let's lo I'm going to log into my game and bring the window on screen here. Oh, no. There's some enemies there. I'm, a, I'm scared. Uh, okay, we'll, we'll battle them. There can only be one. Aha, I'm, win I'm a winner. But I'm almost dead. So this is what the game looks like right now. It's inspired by the old Ultima games. And my ro most recent work has been to make George a smart NPC. So I can talk to him if... Yeah, here we go. And right now I'm working on this script called uh, Help. I just noticed he wanders away even though we're talking to him. That's a bug. Anyway, he's supposed to hold still when we're talking to him. Um, it, he'll offer to lead you out of the sewers. And if you say yes... Then he um, uses the A star pathfinding algorithm to find a way out of the of the level, and he'll guide you through there. And he's got some AI scripts. This is all written in Lua, the script part. Uh, if he runs across an NPC on his way, he will fight them. And uh, if he gets to the exit of the level here, so he get he he killed that guy on his way out. He says, "Here's the way out. Stay safe." And then he paths back to his starting point. And I'm going to follow him because I'm. Scared of these deadly slimes. If any of them spawn on our way back, we'll let George take care of it. So that took like t way too long for me to code in Lua because I had a lot of bugs. And one of the big takeaways I was just showing in my notebook from that is I didn't know, I don't have enough debugging tools between Lua and my game master panel. Um, more would help. Also, I need to refactor my existing scripts and I needed to group together contextually sensitive arguments. So I did the third bullet point. I did some of the second, but this one I thought, you know, it'd be really cool if I could just integrate testing of my Lua scripts along with the testing of my C++ code, which I have in VS Code. It looks like this is Test Explorer UI using this Catch2 and Google Test Explorer plugin. I use Google Tests for my C++ code. So I'm like, what if I made a similar thing for Lua? So that's what I'm doing today. So my goal, if, I don't know if I'll run out of time or not, but the goal would be to have, for example, these example Lua tests, have them automatically detected and show up in this list, and then I can go, you know, run them individually, go to where the test code is, you know, run of individual tests, get the output, but have that work with Lua too, and then I can use that to, um, to build up my Lua scripts using the same kind of test-driven development techniques that I do on C++. What if you create a tool in your game that allows users to create their own maps and then they upload their creations in and check them out? Uh, eventually, I want to have both that and I want to have special zones where players have some sort of limited dungeon master capability, like they that like a pseudo creative mode with limits. I can't let players have free reign over the game, obviously, because they could troll and disrupt the game. Um, but I do want to have let them, you know, be creative in the game. So I want that. The submission of zones, sure. That's even easier. That's where I let you um, assemble them outside the game and maybe it's like a, a, a sandbox type environment. 
and then you upload it to the game and then it goes into a queue of some sort and then I look at it. But that's that's a ways out because I'm still working on this game, the engine. All of the code, all of the stuff you see is um, like 90, 95% handwritten. The only things I didn't write myself are Zlib and SSL stuff and a couple other miscellaneous things, but like the front end web browser app I wrote myself is um, on top of... Um, React and JavaScript phaser and that kind of stuff. And the back end is all mostly handwritten C. Watch out, you should let George handle that slime for you. You should you should walk to the no, oh well, you're dead. I would have walked to the left and kited that slime over and George would have aggroed and killed it for you. Here, let me demonstrate. See what you gotta do is you gotta go over that slime and get him to like attack you and then move over, and then George will take off and get it for you. There he goes. Kill it. Oh, no, he didn't. George gave up. Oh, and I'm dead. <laughs> no. And I'm on the wrong side of George. Well, I attempted, but I failed. You should be able to kite slimes over there and have George take care of them for you. Okay, there's a slime. Now he's chasing me. See that? I'll lead him over here. Until... I get within range of George, and then George takes care of it. See that? And then I go pick up the loot. That's how you play this game. <laughs> Maybe some sort of house zone? Yeah. I was also thinking, if you've ever played the game... Um, oh, what is it called? Um, the one with Lord Dreadmore in it. I can't remember the name of the game, though. So there's a game that I've been playing recently. I totally forgot the name. But in that game, you can get an item... You almost always get the item, like, within an hour of playing, and the item lets you teleport to a pocket dimension where you can, um, yeah, Dungeons and Dreadmore, there you go. Pocket dimension, and then you don't have full creative ability in there, but it kind of gave me the idea of what if every player in my game had a pocket dimension that they could be somewhat creative in? To some limit, like, I would set some number of tile limit like maybe you have a thousand tiles to play with and after that the game would say your dimension has reached its limit and it's starting to fall up like it could have some story based thing like your 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 it could start to erode or something if you reach a limit you know and then we could set the limit based on of uh, uh maybe your what level you've achieved in the game or how trusted you of a client of the game you are that kind of thing right so yeah all these are cool ideas I'll give you a point for bringing it up. And let me put it in my notebook. But yeah, we've thought about that before. And it's definitely what I want to do at some point. Uh, notes, right? There we go. Can you approve your name? As if I know who you are. Do I know who you are? There's a couple ways that you can do that. If you created an account through the Twitch, then I'll... Uh, so there you go. I can unmask. I can. Un I know who you are already, so I can unmask you. So this player as well. This one, like though, I don't want to show that on stream because it could be a troll. Um. So you did have to say, yeah, I am player four nine five. Okay. Let me take it off screen to verify. And show. Okay. Captain Noob, welcome. Yeah, so you see, uh, it's a little safety thing. We've had trolls in the past come in and, and spam and stuff. So as long as I know it, I can trace it back to a Twitch account. I can ban the account if they become a, a pain in the game. All right. Yeah, these slimes, they're bugged right now in that they uh, attack way too frequently. My apologies for the... OP slimes at the moment. Here, I'll come help you. Oh, you already died. Die, there can only be one. I'll leave the loot, though. There are other bugs. There's, like, over 100 bugs. You have to, um... What do they say when there's construction in an area? Please forgive our mess while we... while we're during construction. So, um... You can always report games... Uh, bugs through this ticketing system in the game, or you can report them in GitHub. Or you can search the GitHub for known issues. And please be patient about me fixing them because it takes me a while to do everything. It reminds you a bit of Dwarf Fortress's carp. Yeah, they're kind of ruthless, aren't they? Like way more OP than they should be. 
Anyway. <laughs> Maybe that's why, Nui. These slimes won't, won't forget that. <laughs> All right. Um, let me get back to this. So... I wanted to equip this with um, some logging so that I can see what's going on when it's run by the extension. So let me do this. We're going to... Um, I want to look at fopen. Right, it returns a file, so... Thank you for that follow. Uh, this will call the uh, log file. fopen. Do I really care what the path is? Let's... Have it put it next to the um, executable so I know where it is. File get exe parent directory will work. Needs to be a C string and uh, it needs to. What's the best way to do this? Maybe do it this way. Then I can add slash log.txt to that. And then we're going to write it as a text. Actually, we're going to append and write as a text file. And then we're going to print to it. Um, let's see. Moon unit executed. Or moon unit. Arguments. And then we'll print them down here. Space space s arg c string. Ooh, that was horrible. And then um, when it gets down to the re end here, we'll just close the file. So how does that work? Just f close. All right, void f cl close log. And now I'll build it, and then I need to set up a test runner to actually run that. So here's a little bit of tricky stuff I'm going to be doing. Um, I think I can just build it in the way I build in other tests, right? Um, other test runners. So for example, this test has a add test with a command. So what if, you know, what if I do the exact same thing here? It's going to run itself. Do I need arguments? I was running with arguments, right? Um, right. I forget, is it's working directory? I guess we can just see. Um, if I was running it here, it's two levels up, right? Yeah, so can I run... Um, because add let's let me look up add test in the manual. Uh, we need to see. Hold on. We need to see the CMake manual. Uh, two point nine should be fine. Add test. Name command. Oh, this working directory. Not specified. The test will be run with the current working directory set to the build directory corresponding to the current source directory. I think that should be fine. But how do I pass arguments? Oh, it's the whole command line. So what? If it has spaces, I need to put it in quotes. So probably like this. Path dot dot slash dot dot slash moon unit. Right. I'll just use forward slashes because I like forward slashes and we'll try this. Idea, you should be able to see through secret passages from the inside. Yes, with directional tiles, I could do that. So, it depends on, like, how you, en how you en envision this fantasy of secret passages. Like, old school um, games that I used to play, they looked like walls, but they were, they had no substance. So, either, if you were on the inside or the outside, you'd see a wall, but your hand would pass through it when you pushed against it, Right? So that's one way you could envision a secret passage. The other way is that you um, there's a crack or something, and you don't notice it from the outside, but on the inside there's obviously a, a crevice or something. And then you would just have the tile look different from the other side, and yeah, I could have it with directional tiles. 
Yeah, right. Illusionary wall. So is the secret passage an illusionary wall, or is it just like a subtle thing you can't see from the outside? Yeah, I know. George, George uh, gave away the secret. I know he does that. <laughs> the third kind of wall, right, where the wall like slides back or something. So um, the, the I want my engine to be capable of all three of those. In fact, I'll probably have in the game content lots of places where I want it to either be illusionary or it to be a subtle thing and others where it actually changes like things move or it actually is a um, looks like a door from one side and not from another side so as long as the engine supports it I'm happy okay so if this if this worked properly when I hit reload it should have um, at least run it once so I can look and see if it ran it Right. I can look at the build directory, VS Code, and look at Moon Unit. Okay, here we go. That's when I ran it before. Is it not running it? Oh no, it said it would run it in the build directory. Ah, and maybe it didn't run it. Um log text s let's delete let's delete it and reload again it's supposed to be discovering and trying to run them or what about i maybe the discovery mechanism doesn't work the way i think it does not running it why would it not run it You're excited to see traps? Oh yeah, when I get when I get into test content, um, it's gonna be fun, I think. Or I mean, the real content. Hey there, Cthulhu. How are you doing? I'm getting tired already. <laughs> yeah, well, it's been three hours, forty-two minutes. Um. Maybe I need to look into how this damn extension works. Oh, there's a there's a pattern. Ah ha ha. I may need, need may need to rename it something. I think that's what it is. It has to be something tests.exe. So, uh let's change our CMake to do that for a little bit. We'll call it We'll call the this moon unit tests. There we go. I did it, chat. A testing zone of sorts where you can get feedback on playtesting things without disrupting the main game. Gate on the side of yeah. So there could be, yeah, it's totally. That's an awesome idea. Oh, I did a hey. This is why this is what happens when I get tired. I hit the wrong button. Watch me hit the wrong button and I accidentally ban you one one of these days. My apologies in advance. I know it's going to happen at some point. Lull again, yeah. Macros, yeah. Don't let, don't give, don't um put the macros in the hands of the tired people. All right, so when this runs, when this refreshes, it should at least try to discover tests by running my program, and and we should be able to see that here, right? Oh, there it goes. So type. It did it did a dash dash help. So what does G test do for our dash dash help? We're just gonna mimic it, right? Um I don't know. Do what what do what do what do you think it it expects all of this junk? Running main blah 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 blah. I mean, we can see if it gets one step further just by manually putting this typos and all into our code. Uh, come on, scroll. Scroll. Okay, here. Copy that into this main for if it's help, right? Uh, question is, which stream is it going to? Probably standard error. But who knows? Maybe, maybe not, right? 
All right. Let's do a, a bunch of um a little bit of ma of a uh, multi cursor magic here. So if that's like that, then we're gonna go scroll down with multi cursor mode till we get to the end, and then do that. Go to the end and put one there, and I know that there's a double one there. I'll fix that in a minute. New line. And then I need to escape all of the double quotes that are in that happen to be in there now. And double escape all of these. Escape, escape. One more. Done. Oh, I need to indent two more levels and add a closing parentheses. Uh, oh, it's indented too far. There we go. That should be fine. Technically, I shouldn't use fprintf, right? I should use fwrite, but I'm being lazy. I don't really care. So let's uh, recycle and see if it gets run with something else this time. I want to fool it into thinking it's a Google test thing. And it didn't, it wasn't fooled. Okay. What if I run it like that? Mm. I mean, it printed the exact same thing out except for without the formatting, right? Ah, uh, hold on. Oh, I should have run it from there. That is the same as that, right? Except without the formatting. I wonder if the formatting matters. It did do that at the end, so we don't want it to do that. I have it terminate itself if we get an, a, a help. Uh, it's really bad to do this, but just we're just hacking this, right? So we can do an exit zero. We do an exit zero and then it terminates immediately and then maybe if we fool this guy into... into um, I want it to, after it after it checks to see if it looks like a Google test runner that actually tries to collect test names from it. That's what I'm hoping to get out of this. Uh, is it doing it from here? Here. I should delete it after every run. Run it once and see how many times did it invoke it. Just run, ran it once. Okay, it could be that it's going to standard output. Let me test this theory. I just redirect one of it to out. Okay, it's standard output, not standard error. So just printf. And then... Oh, there we go. Got further. It wants to do a G test list tests output. So it wants XML output. Well, shoot, I hate XML. <laughs> I was hoping it would be JSON. You know, super secret project is in secret has a name, but that's not as fun as a super secret project. It's not secret anymore. It's called Bouncer and it's in my GitHub. I've been showing it here and there. My little stream helper. It's, it's wrong in some of these, like I already said hi to Slickfer. But it's it's um it popped them up again because uh I lost the um connection to Twitch and there's a bug and that doesn't reconnect. You know? You can see your own chat show up there. That's that that's a super secret project. Disable macros? Which macros? Oh my own macros. I would have to use my uh bouncer for Twitch chat, but I still use Yada. 
I guess I could request that Hideo make a feature that disables my macros after I stream for four hours. <laughs> anyway, um, it wants XML I put so, and it wants me to put it in a file. So what if I ask this to do the same? GTest list tests. And then we just want some XML file name, right? What is it going to do? Out.xml. So it's still... Oop, I'm being raided. Mike! Hey there, Mike in principle. If you don't know Mike in principle, he made this game called Thrusty Ship that he's been working on improving lately. And he's a seasoned game dev. You should check out his stream and his game. You see Lewis script. Yeah, I am writing a uh, unit test runner for Lua. So let me run it for you. Uh, I have to be in the correct path, though. So there's what the runner's output. Um, I had it working with this example script here where we have um, a test that passes, two tests that pass, actually three tests that pass, um, and two tests that fail, one that fails with an assertion, so it was, should stop early, and the other one that should fail but continue because it has two expects. And we see what we expect, right? We have um, three tests that pass. Where's the third one? Yeah, one, two, three. And then we have the two tests that fail, and the tests that fail have the nice um, explanation about what was the expected value in the actual and then the trace back so you can see what line number in the in the script that under test and all that stuff you would like to see a demo of lua in my game or the the lua i'm working on right now is the is i'm building up a test framework for my lua scripts let me show you the lua scripts i have for my game first let me show you my game and to do that i need to open up a new window because i closed the last one let me open up a new window. Go to my game. This is my game. It's based off, or not based off, it's inspired by the old Ultima games from the 80s, right? And you control a character. You're always, in general, going to see the world around you as this 2D tile, uh, rough pixel art. It's mostly going to be what Mike likes to call a very cerebral game. And you can play it now. You can join me in this game. Um, cerebral in, the, in that most of the interaction in the game is going to be going to be through text. So you, when you're talking to characters, you can you can ask them things. And uh, George doesn't really know much, but he does know how to help. He can lead me out of the sewers. Care to follow you? Yes. And he will now uh, lead us out. If I let him, if I lag too far behind, um, oh, he's drawn aggro off of this guy. He really wants to kill that monster. He should... Oh, he's not going to give up, so I'm going to need to move the monster in, in his path for him to not get stuck. So here you go. Have this monster. There you go. So he killed the monster, and now he is continuing on. He'll fight any monsters that get in his way. All right, so you get the idea, right? Let, I'll let George continue, and in the, I'll get to the, what you wanted to see, the Lewis scripts, right? So it, the game engine is C++, but it runs Lua to... um figure out how to change the entity component system. The, so the systems in the entity component system are mostly in Lua, and so one of them is like the N NPC's AI script. And I can edit it live in-game because it's Lua. Every time I submit, it will re-evaluate the script. But the script is better viewed in a syntax-highlighted place, so let me show you that. Um, source, ECS, scripts, NPC, AI... So, at the very high level, it's not refactored yet, but we're building a cache of player info, building a cache of enemy info, and then have all NPCs act. So we, we're going to visit the entity component system, and we say all, all components of type NPC run this function. It says if the next action time is um, in, the, in the past or now, then we build up a context of variables that we need, and we tell the NPC to act. Now, the NPC act depends on what kind of NPC they are, for example. 
Uh, we, with their position and their movement capability, we see if they're a guide type NPC, they have special logic. If um, they're a, a, if they have this class attribute, that means they're randomly spawned. So skip them if they don't have it. And if they're randomly spawned, they aggro and attack players that are nearby. The special guide one has different states. So it depends on um, what uh, state he's in. So if he's in the state patrol, he'll go to this patrol script. And the patrol script just says pursue or return um, the home tether position if you're out of range, else wander. I'm paraphrasing what the logic is. But you can kind of see how it fits together. These, um, the, uh, the script gets access to the framework and the component data through this global singleton called game. And it has a method called with, you know, different methods. One of them is like with entity component of type, where if you know the entity ID and you know what type of the component you want from it, you can um, have a function called back given that data. So if you wanted to see the position of a certain entity and with that position you want to do something with it, that's how you do it there. Um, so so everything in the in the entity component system is has a number. So George is 18145 and he has five components. His movement capability mask, um, his position in the game, and it looks easier if I show you this, depth 30, x1, y0, and this is the entity ID of the zone that he's in. And here's his tile information. He is that tile. Or in the raw form, it looks like this. And there's a nameplate you can edit if you want. The NPC component has most of his data because that's he's an NPC entity, so it makes sense, right? A lot of stuff in here, like his action cooldown, the list of entities he's, entities that he's aggroed, his aggro range, his attributes like dexterity and armor, stuff like that. Attackable, it's false. If I set it to true, then players would be able to kill George, and I wouldn't want that. Um, he patrols near a home position, so he's got a home position marker. And then whenever he's um, pathfinding, we'll also store his uh, current path and how far he is along the path in um, in that structure. So... There you go. That's the rundown. And Mike had to go, so see you, Mike. If you guys have any questions, let me know. Every time you watch the stream, you feel bad about yourself? Don't feel bad about yourself. Remember that uh, I've been doing this for a while, and I'm still learning. So I've done C, C++ for like 20 plus years, but I hadn't really done any serious game development, and still, like, a lot of this is has a long way to go so there's a lot of bugs and i've been working on this for like over a year so um i think i'm my harshest critic so when um when people say my architecture looks nice like m balrog just said i mean that i appreciate the compliment i don't think so i think i need to improve it so i'm always trying to set the bar really high and reach that um but this is a lifelong goal for me, is to take a game that I loved playing when I was a kid and make something that looked like that and then say that I did that. And what makes it special for me in particular is I'm making the engine too. So I can say not only did I make a game that I always wanted to play, but I made the game engine as well. I totally do not recommend that for everyone though. Most people are better off just taking a game engine like Unity or Unreal, Game Maker, Go, uh, was it... Um, What's the name of that other one? Godot. Something like that. And um, building a game off of an engine. You'd, be, you'd get it done quicker and it would look nicer. Why the decision to make this an online game? Because in the last 20 years, my main interests have been in networking and uh, real-time stuff. So problems like how to synchronize multiple clients and share state in, on a server... Uh, I find very interesting, and also communication between different computers I find interesting. So the net code, it's not that advanced. If you if you ran my game and you opened up the um, the developer tools and you, um, you'll you see that there's a WebSocket connection between the uh, your web client and the game servers, and the content of the WebSocket messages, they're all JSON, so they're really easy to understand. Um, because everyone has like a type of message and there'll be things like moving sprite or add remove sprite and if you move it'll say player input change that kind of thing you'll be able to figure it out in fact i've had some viewers that have gone and made um uh programs that have to um to sort of their own versions of the front end tool but 
uh, their own little things. So that, that's that been fun. Think Nuclear Throne is made in Game Maker? Yeah. I know a lot of people who are, are a lot further along in their game dev careers than I am will recommend either Unreal, Unity, or Game Maker Pro, or uh, Godot. Those are the main four that I have heard of. You made a thing, but your shirt's broken now? That's right. A squared made a front end to this to this game. Uh, it might not be as broken as you think. There might just be some messages that your client won't understand. So is undertaking this sort of project more of the journey? Um, for me, it's become both. For a long time, it was the journey, but I've been working on this long enough where I really want to see the destination. <laughs> so um, I'm hoping... I'm pushing myself by making this my job right now. So I got laid off from my last job because they had a huge, m massive layoff that I got swept up in. And I'm like, I could either go find another job, which wouldn't be too hard because I got all this experience. Or, you know, I've been saving up for a while. What if I make a go at doing this thing I've always wanted to do? And I'll push myself by forming a company and saying, my company's goal is to do this and eventually to be making money by having... um the game free to play up to a point where if you're enjoying the game, maybe to unlock the next dungeon, you'd pay a dollar. And if I get enough people to do that, then it, it supports itself. And that would be, that would be awesome. Now I'm okay with it not succeeding as long as um, I'm, if it's something that I'm willing to play, then I'll have fun just making it so that I can play it and my kids can play it. And then um, find a, find something else to, to, to support myself. Right. That's fine. Be super awesome if I could make this profitable though at some point. Yeah, that would be a dream come true. It is more of a dream though, uh, but I am pushing myself by uh, saying that this is my job. I stream this on Twitch as my job. So, you want this game to be financially viable? At, at some point, it would be nice, but I know there's a lot of things I need to do and a lot of things I need to learn. I'm not marketing this game at all. My strategy right now is to do this completely uh, on Twitch. And to grow the community around it and sort of I'm gauging interest in it. I'm getting feedback that helps the direction of it. And I'm learning how to market it so that I can, if I, once I get more confident, I can make maybe make a big marketing push, maybe even hire an artist or two to um, solidify the game so it increase its chance of success and then make a push for uh, some financial goal. But right now I'm still kind of testing the water, so to speak. And it's more likely than not right now that unless I put more money into it, more, um, more push. It'll probably just end up being a hobby that I'll, in the end, I'll be happy that I accomplished it. Cause I've always wanted to do this. So one of those bucket list items, but you know, I'll probably have to fall back to something else at some point. <laughs> so anyway, I hope I answered enough of the questions. A lot of this stuff is, uh, in my GitHub. The, uh, only things that aren't in GitHub are the actual game code at the very top layer because obviously I want to try to make a product out of it but all of the reusable components that I make since I make a lot of stuff online I mean uh, uh, since I make a lot of stuff um, from scratch uh, things like how my web sockets are implemented I did that from scratch so and I don't mind making it open source so it's MIT license it's in my github you can find how I implemented web sockets same thing with my Twitch APIs, all of the, um, the way it, it connects into Twitch and all that. Um, it's probably not a, a, a really good screen to show, but, you know, I have a lot of code written that knows how to talk to Twitch chat, for example, right? Um, I've, done, I've done all the email stuff, authentication. I even have some uh, server co coherence uh, consistency stuff implemented so all of that is is public and open source talk to you what, did, what 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 would you like me to say and perry can you get a band do you really want to be banned <laughs> you don't want to ban and perry looking for private keys you won't find any in my source code hopefully if you if you do find it let me know did the web sockets and cbp or myself yeah i did and it's in my youtube as a vod so if you really wanted to you can find web socket I did that last Ju last August, last July, July twenty eighth. There you go. So if you looked in my YouTube way back and in, in, in stream number twenty nine, you'll see me write it from scratch, basically. 
and I've done web server, web client stuff. I did Amazon Web Services, S3, put, get, all that. I've done hash functions. There's a lot of stuff you have to be prepared to do if you're going to write things from scratch. And, you know, I, I can't do everything. For example, I would be a fool to try to do encryption myself, so I picked up Libra SSL. It integrated pretty nicely, and I didn't find compression that interesting, so I just picked up Zlib. So I didn't write those. Yeah, exactly, Cyfex. I did not want to risk anything security-wise, so I picked up an existing implementation for SSL, and I just leveraged that. Yeah, so Libra SSL does the encryption part of the authentication. Stuff like logging in through Twitch, it's mostly just verifying signatures and using the OpenID Connect flow. And that I showed on stream to, anyway, or I think I did. Maybe not. But anyway, it's not, it's, it's, um, it's checked into my public GitHub stuff. So it's, yeah, Base64, for whatever, for, for as much of it as, as it encrypts, which isn't anything really, um, I did that and it's public. So that's not hard to do. Especially things that have known test vectors. Base64, all the hash functions like, like um, SHA-1, SHA-256, SHA-512, they all have, you know, proven test vectors out there you can grab and you put it right into your own unit tests and, and then you ver verify your hash function works correctly. So, yeah. So, anyway, that, that was... Let me, let me fold this back into... Um, I'm trying to improve how I develop my own Lua scripts for the game. And I'm trying to sort of reverse engineer what does um, the uh, extension I use, Catch2 and Google Test, what it expects. And so I'm having it um, print out... Where did, I, where did I do it? I had it print out what... Where did I do that? Oh, right here. I had it print out what the extension asked it to do. And it asked it to list the tests and give it an XML format. XML writing isn't too bad, so maybe I can do that, although I'm out of time for today. Maybe that's what I do tomorrow. Writing the XML output, and then hopefully the next step is if I give it correct XML output, it'll show my tests in the test explorer here like it does for these other guys. And then, um, and then when it comes time to actually run a test, it'll probably try to run it a certain way, and then I need to make sure my test runner obeys. Who's a proponent for make your own encryption? I missed the who. Oh, your crypto professor? Oh, nice. He's one of the guys who made SHA-3 in AES? That's cool. So that's your claim to fame. You you know someone famous. <laughs> so by um by proximity you're famous too in a way, right? I would guess, I would have sort of guess that anyone who made one of the encryption or hash out functions everyone else uses probably would agree that you'd be a fool to do it on your own. He probably leverages a lot of previous work and probably does a lot of testing to make sure it's secure. Which of the AE or S? I even I forget which AES stands for. Yeah, I mean, like, I'm, I'm sure people that in the security cryptography fields probably would agree that you don't want to do it from scratch because there's so many things that could go wrong. You you want to, it's it's kind of like building a plane. You'd be, you'd be insane to build a plane from scratch. You'd want to take an existing plane that works well and at least model it after that, <laughs> if not use parts of it, right? All right. I think I'm probably wrapping up the stream because... Uh, well, I guess I can take a look at the XML format, but I'm I'm going to I'm going to run out of steam soon. I don't know, if you guys want me to keep going, I will. Because I do have some free time. Uh I want to find a good stopping point. Maybe you know, let's see how far I can get with the XML. Maybe it's not too bad. This is what Google test prints out the standard output. So it's like a so this is if we compare that to what web sockets show, right? We can see how how it parallels uh, from this view. Oh, okay, so a one indent level is the suite, and the second indent level are the tests, and there's a dot. Okay, we can do that. 
And then let me look at the XML file that I made. So that's, is that going to be big? That's not too bad. What has it got in there? St standard XML boilerplate, and then a test suites element with a total number of tests in it, and then we have a test suite for every suite, listing how many tests that has, and then for each test, it's a name, and then I'm guessing that file is how it finds the code that goes with it, and then a line number. Okay, we don't know the line numbers of our tests right now. How would I figure that out? That's a tough one. I wonder if there's a way you can find out where a piece of Lua is. So if we're crunching this Lua test, how do we get these line numbers out? That might be tough. Let me think about this. I wonder if there's a way we could like wrap these function declarations in a like, I'm just thinking out loud here. What if I had something like moon unit test and then we put the name here. So I'm thinking pair and like similar to how it's done in um, for Google tests. They have a macro, right? So we have a, we have a, this macro essentially unwraps to either a function call or actually I think it's a class definition. But anyway, this could un this could just be a function call that registers the test internally like this, right? Um, we can say comma function and then do that. Like what if I had something like that and then the, maybe the first thing that this test thing does is it is it rigs up an exception to be thrown and we actually ca capture the stack trace and then we would look up a level or two and know what line number we were at. Would that be too tricky? You know what then, what I could do, you know what I could do? I don't need, actually need the name, do I? No, I do need the name. Hmm, how would I, oh, I could have this thing take the name and store it in a in a global table somewhere right okay maybe i should search to see if there's an easier way <laughs> to do it so what i want to know is in lua a find line number of a function is there a way to know that here we go debug get info current line but I had I had to actually put that in my code somewhere. Can there's a there a way from C to know that? Uh, find line number of function from C. Mm. That might be hard to know, right? In the same answer, didn't it have the C way? I uh, don't know. Oh, you're right. Get Lua, Lua get info. Yeah, but I'd have to, okay, I'd, it means I'd have to do something like this. What would be cool is if I didn't, if I can just do it that way, and then using reflection, like I'm doing now, uh, figure it out. So like the, the reflection technique I'm using now is I am looking at, where is it? It's up here somewhere, right? Or is it down? Oh, it was buried in here. I'm reflecting on the global table, right? And I'm looking for all names that start with test underscore. If there was some way with that name, with um, this key, that I can say, okay, underscore G, where was that defined? What line number? But I don't think there's a way to know that, right? Maybe... Um, get line number where uh, of variable declaration. Ah, there's probably not a way to do it like with reflection the way I want. 
Yeah, I don't know. So maybe I just do it this way. So it uh, means I would have a wrapper, and the first thing that this would do, um, well, it, wait a minute. Maybe I have to walk the stack, right? Get info for a different stack level. Or uh, maybe there's something else in the debug I should be looking at. Uh, let me maybe browse the Lua debug. Oh, thank you for that follow. Fills only private part. Blah blah. These get info. Okay, we have the line number, but can I look at a previous level? Maybe that's get info. Ooh. To get information about a function, you push it onto the stack and start the what string with the character greater than. Ooh, this might work. Let's check it out. So let me um, comment that. Oops, I didn't mean to do that. Comment that. And what if in here we called Lua get info? You mentioned earlier that you dealt with networking a lot in your career. What sort of domain was it in? Um, I was in the multimedia research and development team at Qualcomm. So one of the main things I did was um, support like simulating a cellular network in um, either voice communication or multimedia exchange. So um, I would work with the people that developed the voice compression algorithms. They call them vocoders. Now I have to come to understand vocoder means something else. But to them, vocoder was an audio compressor, decompressor. And uh, they had the algorithm in C, and they're like, we, we're, we want to port this to the DSP, and we want to run it in a cellular network that doesn't yet exist. Can we simulate that? So we would set up... Uh, programs on different computers that would simulate a cell phone from the perspective of the voice encoder. So all the voice encoder cares about is, here's a packet, send it to the other guy. Give me any packets you receive back from him so that I can decode that and turn them into audio. And and so it was left up to, up, left up to us what networking to use. So at first, I think I just used a... We were using like serial cables back in the day. And we would just send the bytes one at a time over over this over a serial port and then when we moved up to networking we would just um, open up a socket and send them byte for byte and then after a while I'm like this this is too um, uh, too much from scratch you know where who would do such a thing right and uh, got into actual networking protocols that are used for exchanging multimedia real time so that would be like RTP RTSP um, MPEG uh, transport layer, transport stream. So I ended up implementing like an RTP stack, an R uh, RTSP, and we also did um, MPEG transport stream, which is what's uh, what under is the underlying transport for digital television. So we got into all sorts of cool things like synchronizing streams with televisions, you know, players synchronizing with with um, producers and that kind of thing. Um, and I always have found it the 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 challenge is really cool and uh, fun to work on. How do you get the latency low and the jitter or judder sometimes they call it um, hidden? And how do you handle errors when um, you're getting voice and audio like generated or sampled from from the real world, encoded, and and you need to get that from point A to B, and when it gets from P, from point A to B, how do you reconstruct it into the into the uh, to reproduce the original source material the best you can? There are a lot of challenges there, and it was really fun, especially when they were were asking us to prototype new um, compression technologies. It's like we could say we were the first to make a phone call with the um, at the time it was uh, the CDMA um, system. We were the first to make the uh, a simulated voice call between to phones that are really computers. <laughs> um, and that was when I, way back when I was an intern. The, the smart people, the big brain people around me would, were figuring out how to compress voice down from 64 kilobits per second down to eight or less and have it sound good. And that was a challenge at the time. 
Anything to do with SS7? Um, that's, are you talking about like the, um, seven layers of, um, networking systems? Because I mostly dealt with transport layer stuff. Getting information from one point to another over a network and doing it in real time. So network and link layer stuff. Some application level stuff, like uh, if you do voice over IP, there's a signaling protocols, like one of them is called SIP, Session Initiation Protocol. And that's for like when you're making, when you're trying to set a, uh, uh, set a phone call and the other one has to, has to receive it and ring, and then when they pick up, you answer, and you have to negotiate what what compression schemes to use. That was fun too. <laughs> so SS seven may be similar to what I'm thinking of the SIP protocol, um, but fundamentally, the the sound, the audio or video, or whatever that you're exchanging in a phone network will be um, just transporting where they call them frames or packets, and each one is representing a segment of time. Or uh, in the case of video, it's a little bit more complicated. It could be like um, the um, blocks of a, of a motion picture. I think they call them a different terminology. But anyway, um, you're mostly just getting those frames or blocks from one point to the other, and, and you let the big-brained people's algorithms encode and decode them for you. <laughs> So yeah, I guess you could say I was uh, supporting their development as like a tools provider. So making custom simulations and tools to support the people who are making the algorithms that go into phones for encoding and decoding content. I got to learn about a lot. I got to learn a lot about different formats like uh, MP3, MP4, uh, H.264, H.265, all that stuff. Okay, see ya, Nui. I know it's late. And I've gone on to a let's talking mode. But yeah, um, the cool thing is I get to list on my resume uh, a ton of network and multimedia format standards. <laughs> and, I can, and, I, I'm, and I've done this on stream where I, I will take a, an internet RFC that specifies how you implement web sockets, for example, and I have no I have no trouble opening that up and reading it cover to cover, so to speak. And it's kind of fun. I've even gotten my name on one or two of those. So let's see. I am I wanted to see if I can use get info, right? To figure out where these functions are. So I need a Lua debug, essentially. Uh Lua debug. So we're going to call it what? Debug, I guess. And then Lua get info. Uh, Impl Lua. And then this is where I'm going to refer to this manual page. Because it says I can do a greater than and then, and then the name of the function. Oh, I need to put it on the stack first. I can do that. So what... To get information about the fun, a function you push... To get information about a function, you push it on the stack and start the what with greater than. For instance, to know in which line a function is defined, you can write... So it's S. Oh, okay. It's just greater than S. And then the address of debug. But I need to have pushed it onto the stack, so... I have it on the stack, don't I? No, uh, oh, it's at position negative one. Does it pop it off? It might, so I might need to push it again. Each character selects some fields of the structure to be filled or a value to be pushed on the stack. Okay, so we're not pushing onto the stack anything. And then what are we popping off? Um, oh, in that case, it pops the function off the stack. So we need that, don't we? Oh, we're already popping it off. So I can just have it, let it pop it off. And if we didn't need it, we'll pop it off manually. There we go. So just to play around with this, let me do a printf. Uh, we think 
that function there is at line is defined on line um, defined at line number uh, what is the thing back to Lua debug int so d and it's going to be a key dot c string and then the line number is the debug dot line defined yeah debug dot line defined i don't know let's try oops how did i get there build and then let's run it um it didn't seem to oh cuz i it renamed it test didn't i test there we go. We got line numbers. Are they correct though? It'd be sweet if they're correct. So test square zero twenty two. Oh, nice. Non zero twenty eight. Okay, cool. Got it. So I'm gonna say that since Toulouse said in that same answer didn't have the C way, I'm gonna give him a point because he was correct. And Doc uh, D twenty seven, you are correct as well. So it fills in those things. I really only needed line defined because I know what file it came from. How do I feel about the majority of streaming video today, including Twitch plus YouTube, just being chunks of MP4 files sent over HTTP? Uh, I would say that I feel that they do a pretty good job because I hardly ever see Judder or... Um, Real any any kind of the problems that I've I'm, I used to see working with that stuff. Um, there's always people always have trouble with some with latency, um, but I, I think they generally do a pretty good job. And I actually haven't looked into what they use. If it's chunks of MP4 files, then that's one form of streaming technology. What really was um, made it complicated but also fun is um, there's not just one standard, but there's like uh, there's probably a dozen different standards for how you stream video. And that comes from the fact that companies don't want to collaborate on it. They want to stand out and compete and look better than other companies. So Apple would make their own proprietary standards and Microsoft would do the same. And then you have you end up with like whoever ends up on top, the top two or three protocols. Same thing with digital television. So the U.S. standard is different from the European standard. Uh, and there are even different standards um, standards uh, bodies. So there's the North American, uh, what is it? North American Broadcasters, NAB. And then the European Union, Union has their own um, standards bodies for, for television. <laughs> so um, it's challenging, but it's kind of fun. You get to learn a variety of ways things have been solved by different people. How many times do you hard code the memory usage? Zero times. <laughs> I know what you mean, though. I saw that that was... I rolled my eyes at that. I'm like, oh, give me a break. Can't they at least say TBD or something? <laughs> at Qualcomm, that's what people would do. If they didn't have an answer, they would just write TBD. So it would be like, uh, bandwidth usage, memory usage, TBD. <laughs> to be determined. Okay, so we have the line numbers. I will want to give them back on request in the XML. So I think what I will do is form a data structure where we where we hold these, hold on to these. In fact, I'm going to augment test names. I'm I'm not gonna, actually going to restart VS Code because IntelliSense is broken right now. Thank you for the follow, by the way. All right. Continuing on. I'm getting hungry too. I'm gonna have to stop soon. Stop and eat. Test. Oh, we were doing on the fly. Oh, and I thought about doing this separate too, didn't I? Yeah, let's do this on load script. I think it's safe to do it at any point, right? So we could do it here. 
And we could say, uh, actually, let's do it if it's okay. Let's just do it there. If it's not okay, um, it's a problem. Actually, you know what? I'm, I really should have this be a sub function, shouldn't I? Let's make a sub function called um, find tests. And we'll make that inside of impl. We'll do the right thing for once, right? And so that will be a method here find tests. So at least the whole thing of what we're doing has a name called find tests. And then I can get rid of the impulse, which is a kind of nice side effect. Okay, so we're using reflection on the global. Oh, one thing is we won't know the name, will we? We can tell it the name, though, because we have the name. There, now you have the name. Con, oops, con string name. So we're looking for a test, and if we found it, so that's, um, let's give it a name. Const auto line number equals that. And I'm going to put that into uh, something else. So actually, let's have that in here. Test dot line number, and then we'll have test dot name equals key. And we're only loading one file at a time right now, so let's just keep it at that. And we'll have tests push back move test. So I just need, it remains to be seen, I have to define this thing. Uh, let's define it. I can define it anywhere. Let's put it in the global names, the anonymous namespace here. Uh, at the top, it doesn't really matter. Struct test. And then using, um, I don't know. An ordered map or something. No, well, it doesn't really matter. I can use a vector. Tests equals that, right? And then name and line number, right? I know you thought I was ending 30 minutes ago. I think what happens is when I have fun and then I don't have an appointment, uh, Actually, I do have an appointment. I have to go drive someone somewhere in 30 minutes. So I do have a hard stop. But yeah, if I don't have anything else to do, even if I'm hungry, I'll keep going if I'm having fun. Yeah. I have to remember that I need to go somewhere in 27 minutes, so. I should probably end soon because... Let me try to find the stopping point. I think the stopping point I'll find is... I'll get a reconstruction of this XML, and then I'll call it there. When I get a reconstruction of that, you'll remind me. Oh, thank you very much, N. Perry. That's what VIPs do. I appreciate it. Uh, name, right? And then this will be a line number. Let's give that a reasonable default and not be completely undefined. Let me document later. I want to I push to get this XML working. So this will be a test test. And this is impl tests, and I need to make sure... Oh, no, it's not. What is it saying here? It's undefined. Oh, I didn't actually give it storage. So right here, I guess. Okay, gave it storage. I suppose if we call it a second time, we really do want to clear it out. Oh, will not I need to know the name of the thing? I can make the test suite the same name as, well, um, how do I do this? I'll, I'll just, I think I'll just hard code the test suite for now. But I'll need to know the file name. Let me make this, let me make the data structure mirror this, so I'll need to know a file as well as a name. String file, and then uh, name equals so this should have a file equals mm, let's this is ambiguous let's call this file name and then find tests is given the name of the script which is the file actually mm, uh, i think i do want that to be called file name which means I'll want to be consistent and name it file name here. This is, right, well, that's the same. 
that's it, yeah. Should have been named that all along. You have to go somewhere in three hours, 27 minutes. Wait a second, Ann Perry. <laughs> I will get a call saying you forgot to pick up so-and-so. Where were you? You abandoned them. They had to find another ride. <laughs> That'd be like, it's Ann Perry. It's all your fault. <laughs> You're glad I'm not through? Oh, thank you. Uh, we'll... I'd like to set a, a reasonable stopping point and try to stick to it, though. Okay. Right, that built it, and this should um, really just loop through what we already collected, right? Const auto test and, te and impl tests. Uh, test names push back test dot name, right? Return test names. See if that works. All right, and so I should be able to continue running it here. Interesting. Did it end up sorting it? I don't think it did. I think... Why does it look sorted to me? I didn't. I put it into a vector. Why is it sorting it? Is it just coincidence? I Maybe Lua is putting it, it... Maybe Lua is sorting it. That actually would make more sense. Okay, so I'm not going to worry about it. It's working. So then I guess the next step is to try to emulate the output of the XML. So that is in the main function. Actually, that means I need to return in more information. So get test names. What if I... What am I using that for? I'm using it here. I guess I'll just something put something in parallel with this. Um, if the only information is, what is it called? Um, what is it called? G test output XML. What do they call that? Report. I can, okay, there are probably different kinds of reports. I bet if I ran this and didn't have a list test, it would make the report look different, right? Yeah, so it looks different if we actually ran it. Okay, I have an idea that we'll just have it generate a report and the report will be different depending on if we ran the tests or not. If we didn't run the tests, it would ha have this information. Name, file, line. If we ran it, it'll have name, status, time, class name. Sounds good to me. And they have the same structure, so I'll just have to include extra information. So that we'll just call it get report, I think. Um, get report const. Uh, return. I may want to include support JSON in the future, right? So what, let's call it. Hmm. I'll just keep it with with no argument right now. And if I need to, I'll have, add an argument like file format type. Return a report that conforms to the report output of Google test. Uh, re how about return a, con return a report conforming to the report output of Google test that provides details about the uh, tests found and or run. Okay, return. And just this thing is returned. It's fine. All right, get test names. Okay, why it's confused now? Tell sense, it's confused. 
Telesense, how could you? Get test. There we go. But 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 runner runner. All right, so we're just gonna hard code it for now. So um, I'm gonna use our lovely S stream library report, and then the way it works is you do an O string stream, and we'll call it the buffer. And at the end, we're gonna do return buffer dot string. But this lets us shift interesting things into it, and it's sort of like a string builder. Thank you for the follow, by the way. I'm going to just ma just kind of do this stuff. Actually, let's we're we're only going to support the first format for now for today. So it's going to look like this. So it's going to be the standard prefix. And I got to escape these things. And actually, I'm not gonna put the dash slash n. I'm just gonna do the the correct way and do standard n l, and then um, build it up like this piece by piece. So the next piece would be test suites, and then we have a number of tests encoded in there. Lots of viewers. I don't know. It's been getting higher and higher over the time. I think. Uh, I think that's just what just what happens after you've been streaming a while. You you um you're kind of gathering more and more people. Yeah, hi chat. I missed a uh, quote probably. I don't see the missing quote though. I don't see it. Oh, uh, that shouldn't doesn't need to be there, right? Oh, wait a minute. Hold on. Oh, you're right. You're right. I missed it. Thank you, Capybarland. Is XML technically only uh, line feed linings? Uh, I don't know. I guess I could look at it in a binary viewer and see. Uh, we can do this. We can do it. Uh, where would that file be? Build VS Code. Um... WebSockets test out XML. And then I have a way to open that as binary. Come on. Binary or hex. Show hex dump. There we go. Let's look at the line endings. No, it's carriage return line feed. So it's possible that XML only has line feed endings, but in practice, it looks like Google test generates line carriage return line feed. So there we go. Ah, this is useful to keep in the buffer anyway, right? Okay, so we're going to want to um, shift out an actual number here. So num tests, which we don't know yet, but I'll have it in a moment. And then... I think I'm going to hard code the test suite name too. So um, we'll call it um, moon unit tests. And it's the same number, isn't it? And I forgot a shift there. And then, and then the individual test cases. So we can end there, and then I'll I'll do the the um, end part first. So that would be um, this boilerplate ending of it. Why do I keep doing Alt Tab? I don't know. So that's two spaces there. New line. And then test suites. Okay. And then in between, we're going to loop through all of the tests, right? Actually, num test. Let's get that while we have a chance. Const auto num tests equals tests dot. Actually, it's impl. 
test.size. There we go. For const auto test in impl tests. Buffer output test case. So there's the name, the file, and the line, and then the end line. So just to make it easier to read, let me do this. Standard end though. And then this gets replaced by the name of the test, right? Name. And this gets replaced by the name of the file. And this gets replaced by the line number. Easy peasy. And let's try that out. Okay. Um, oh, I'm not actually using it though. Um, that is when I do, uh, what is that? Arr, where is it? <laughs> I'm not seeing it. Thank you for the follow, by the way. Oh, here it is. G test underscore output equals XML colon and then a path. Okay, so a little bit more work. Um, let's have an environment variable. Uh, report path, and I'm not going to document it because I'm running out of time. Um, we need that to simulate. Well, I need some of that. I need to figure out. I can probably prune this a bit to see what the actual extension cares about. I don't know yet. Else, if how come I keep it's just arg equals g test output, and actually it's going to be a substring, right? Equals XML colon something. So let's make this a, a constant of some kind up here static const and a string report. Uh, what do you call it? Parameter, field, argument, prefix equals that, and then con uh, static const auto that length equals that uh, length, and then um, yeah, I gotta go real soon. If Arg dot substring zero comma that equals that. Then const auto um out um environment dot report path is arg substring starting from there. Okay. We've extracted the report file. So when we get out here, we're gonna generate that, right? Uh, we can do that. We can do it anywhere. I can like, oh, wait a minute. No, it's, it's per runner, right? Oh, that's interesting. I'll have to re redesign this because right now there's one runner per test file. And I think the extension re expects a suite per test file or something like that, and one runner overall. Ah, okay, we'll just, let's try, let's just make sure the XML looks good. Let's just do it here. If not environment dot report path empty, then we're going to make one. So, um, just like I'm doing the F open with the log, we'll just hack it in there for now. So report equals f open, and we'll just use that path explicitly and write it. 
and then um, F right, F right. The data length one, okay, F right, the data, okay, we need to get the data. Uh, this is report file, so report is runner dot get report. And then F right report data report length one report file and then F void F close report. Not I'm not checking any of the return values to see if there was a, an error or not. We're just seeing if the dang thing works. <laughs> All right, and then um, then I'll do a dash dash g test output. What was it again? equals xml colon and then just do out.xml type out.xml okay the spacing is wrong we can fix that test case because i'm a perfectionist put the four spaces in there i think it worked nice Five tests, the line numbers are correct. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I got. I really got to go now because I need a few minutes to get ready so I can leave on time. The pedant in you wants those XML property strings to be properly escaped. Which things? I'm literally just copying from what GTest does itself and that it does it like that. So... That's the same escaping and stuff, right? I use forward slashes and they use backslashes. I hope that doesn't matter. If a file path contains special characters, but it's not going to, is it? I see what you mean, though. So I think that's a, actually a valid point. I should probably do that. Let me put a note in there to do that. So follow... Well, not follow up because that's follow up down there. Um, to do. I I do want to worry about it because I want this to I want to check this into GitHub and and it be reusable. So, I um, right. So I I want to have like XML. What do they call it? Element replacement or or element encoding? I want to do the element, not element. It's something else. Entity, entity encoding. Yeah, XML entities. I want to do that correctly. And we will do that, just not right now, because I'm out of time. <laughs> but that's cool. So that should allow this thing to get further. And I'm hoping that it would allow it to... Um, actually, what is it going to do now? Oh, it's missing the uh, listing that that tests. I think it's really close to actually including it in this list. And then uh, running it won't work, but at least we'll, it should list it in, in, the, in the UI for me. Anyway, I'm out of time, my friends. I hope you enjoyed the stream. I'm going to go uh, rate someone right now and then uh, go do what I need to do. Yeah, a lot of interesting people we could rate today. You have a good one too, Toulouse. Thank you for being here. And Mudribbit, thanks for being here. Sorry that I, you came in right at the end. Yeah, thank you, Doc D. And thank you to everybody who followed. I don't have, uh, I don't have this yet, but I'm thinking about collecting, having it collect together the list of everyone who followed and just thanking them at the end. Um, and all that stuff. I'm thinking of just raiding Zeratar again. Did I raid him like a few times ago? He he might be near the end of his stream, though. It's almost five hours. But hey, that's what makes raids fun, right? You raid someone right when they're right trying to, to end, and now they have to keep going? Right? <laughs> you must keep streaming because we just raided you. So Zeratar is working on a Twitch-integrated game in Unity, and it's pretty cool. You um, do, like, exclamation point join, and you have a character named after you in his game, and you can tell it, like, exclamation point tr uh, train uh 
awl or train wood cutting or whatever, and your little character um, does its thing. It's sort of like an idle game. So you can also interact with the stream. He, you can make him do jump scares or mistype or misclick. It's all, all in good fun. So I hope you enjoy that. Anyway, I will hopefully see you guys tomorrow. Where's my little window? There it is. Okay. Enjoy Zeratar. See you tomorrow. Bye. <laughs>